Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum. I'm Dan Brissett, the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Studies. Um, you're not actually going to be hearing much from me today, which is a good thing, uh, because we have such a jam-packed schedule. Um, so let me take this moment to direct everyone to our website for lots more information. Please visit www.esi.org forward slash expo for more information about the expo itself, uh, the two congressional caucuses we'll be hearing from, as well as to sign up for our biweekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Of course, we're coming to you virtually today, um, and uh, um, hopefully we will be in person the next time we have a Congressional Clean Energy Expo. Um, I'm very pleased to let everyone know that we'll be hearing remarks from all five of our caucus co-chairs over the course of the afternoon. Uh, we will also be hearing from Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary Alejandro Moreno uh, with the Department of Energy's Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. We are also going to be hearing from experts and leaders um, on two panels. The first uh, that will start at about 2.10 p.m., National Security and Climate Change. Uh, and then we'll be hearing um, from a group of experts and, and leaders a little bit later in the afternoon on clean energy sector workforce development. But like I said, you're not going to be hearing much from me. So I'm going to do my best to turn it over to our speakers uh, and to keep, the, keep things running on time. Let me... Um, take a quick moment to share a special thanks to our co-chairs, uh, Senators Reed, Crapo, Collins, and Van Hollen. And let me also take a moment to share special thanks with Representative Ron Kind uh, of Wisconsin. We'll hear from him in just a moment. This is actually his first time addressing the Expo because he only recently became chair uh, of the House uh, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. But he's a great leader when it comes to these issues, and we're really, really happy to have him um, on board with the caucus. So let me do that. I'll introduce uh, Representative Ron Kind, who represents the 3rd District of Wisconsin in the U.S. Health, uh, House of Representatives. Um, so let's go to that conversation now. Uh, well, Representative Ron Kind from Wisconsin, 3rd District, thank you for joining us today and welcome to the leadership of the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Great, Great. To thanks, Dan. Glad to be with you. Absolutely. Um, sir, um, I'd like to ask you a couple questions, and I'd like to start with maybe one of the basic ones. Uh, why did you decide to chair the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus, and what makes you enthusiastic uh, about renewable energy and energy efficiency? Well, first of all, thanks for the invite to kick things off with you on that, and thanks to everyone who's participating. I can't think of a more important issue facing Congress uh, this year, the nation, the globe, really, because of the existential threat that global climate change is facing. So. For me, it was a no-brainer, uh, joining the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficient Caucus as co-chair to build bipartisan support on such an overriding issue. Uh, looking at the Renewable Energy Caucus general principles, I'm in complete agreement with that climate change is an existential threat. There are solutions that are achievable. A healthy uh, environment and a healthy economy go hand in hand, and U.S. leadership is crucial uh, for all this. So I was happy that one of the first steps that President Biden did on the first day in office was getting us back into the Paris Agreement. We have to have a seat at the table. We have to be offering U.S. leadership and the technological know-how that we bring to the table to help the rest of the world achieve the goals that we all share as inhabitants of this small planet. And I'm seeing a lot of the progress being made back home in my large rural western Wisconsin district, something we can talk about in a little more detail. Great, thanks. Um, Members of Congress are also energy consumers, and I'm curious if you have personal experience with renewable energy and energy efficiency, and if so, how has that influenced your thinking about sustainability and, and climate? You know, I, I do have some personal experience because um, a few years ago, a cabin that my wife and I built on our small family farm got struck by lightning, and it went down. We relied on propane gas uh, for our energy needs at the time, but when we rebuilt, uh, thank goodness for insurance, we went with geothermal energy uh, for heating and cooling purposes, and it has worked marvelously. And I've always scratched my head why we're not tapping geothermal more frequently, especially in uh, climate challenged environments like we have in the upper Midwest, where the sun may not shine all the time, or the wind might not be blowing all the time, but that constant ambient temperature just five feet below the surface can provide cooling and heating uh, year round. So we couldn't be happier from that. But I also see firsthand in my own congressional district. I've got a small 
rural community called Cashton uh, that has become the renewable energy capital of the world. Uh, they've done geothermal with their businesses on Main Street. They partnered with the largest uh, organic co-op in the nation, Organic Valley, along with one of the bigger healthcare providers to develop wind turbines. And they partnered with XL Energy to establish a huge solar farm. And this is just a small rural community doing all this, which shows that it can be done. If it can be done in Cashton, Wisconsin, it can be done anywhere in the world. Well, sir, over the years, ESI has highlighted farms and farming communities, um, especially those that have put uh, sustainable land use solutions in place and adopted clean energy technologies like the ones you just described. Um, based on the experience of Wisconsin in your district, um, sort of where do you see opportunities for renewable energy and energy efficiency in the agricultural sector? You know, I have, uh, I think, more rural electric co-ops than any other congressional district in the world. And I give them a lot of credit. Even though Wisconsin has been pretty coal dependent throughout our history, they're really making an effort to diversify the energy sources, moving to more renewable, sustainable, greener energy projects. And they're working with local communities, with the local farmers uh, in particular that they service to diversify those energy sources, to increase energy efficiency. Again, a major goal of the caucus is how do we uh, make operations, homes, farms, more energy efficient, just with the technology that already exists and the know-how that already exists. So again, it's an example of how a state, Wisconsin, that's been very coal dependent, mainly from Wyoming, where we had to spend a lot of money to bring in our energy, uh, is starting to diversify and do it on our own in a more sustainable fashion and creating good paying jobs at the same time. And that gets back to one of the principles of the caucus that a healthy environment, a healthy economy go hand in hand. And we're witnessing that firsthand throughout Western Wisconsin right now. For sure, and, and one of our panels a little bit later today, we'll, we'll look at, um, sort of look across the clean energy sector and identify workforce development opportunities. Right. Um, climate change is on the minds of many Americans, and I'm curious what concerns people in the third district of Wisconsin about climate change, and what are, some of the additional climate solutions that are making a positive difference in the lives of your constituents and helping them also improve the resilience of their communities. You know, there's virtually no place in the country, the world that's not impacted by climate change. For us in the upper Midwest, it's some perennial flooding that is happening all too frequently with the coolies and the, the bluffs, the valley, valleys that I represent. It's not hard to funnel sudden downpours of water affecting many communities. So I've been dealing with flood mitigation efforts because of climate change and the projection is for it to continue until we can get a grip on all this. So I've become good friends with FEMA throughout the years, as you can imagine. But there are a lot of win-wins involved with this too. I've recently reintroduced a bipartisan bill to make it easier to establish biomethane uh, digesters for farms. Um, this is from animal waste, manure management, which otherwise might flow off the property into our drinking supply can be corralled now in order to produce uh, energy. Uh, and we've got, again, Organic Valley, Gunderson, uh, health provider, investing in these type of uh, projects. Uh, I've been one of the leading voices for a strong conservation title of the Farm Bill. Again, something that's very important for rural communities throughout uh, America, uh, including energy efficient uh, means. And farmers wanna do this. And the next Farm Bill we could tee up for major carbon sequestration on farms and in rural areas to create real benefits and incentives for them to do more in, in sequestering any carbon emission that would normally take place based on past farming practices. A lot of research, a lot of science going into all of this. So that's one reason, again, I, I'm delighted to be a part of this caucus because of the exciting change that's happening, the tremendous potential that exists right in front of us and the ability to do this in a bipartisan way because I think people now are beginning to realize that this is not a partisan issue, it shouldn't be, and that there are some practical solutions that can strengthen and grow the economy with good paying jobs. Um, so many families um, spend a significant share of their monthly income paying their utility bills and um, energy burdens um, are often highest in rural communities, um, as well as in communities of color and uh, in tribal communities. Um, how could U.S. energy policy do a better job addressing equitable access to affordable clean energy in rural areas and ease the weight of those energy burdens? 
Well, I think one of the places we can start in the investments that we've made, and it's part of our Green Act actually coming out of the Ways and Means community, a more sustainable energy equation along with uh, enhanced efficiency measures is how do we have, help people consume less energy, what they need through energy efficiency, the deployment of technology that can help reduce that consumption and footprint uh, that people rely on. That, as we know, working with businesses uh, makes bottom line sense uh, for their profit margins. And the same is true for families, that when you go in, you work on a farm or in a, in a home to make it more energy efficient, you could have a $500 monthly bill dropped to 100 bucks a month. What a huge cost savings that will be to uh, families across America. And that's part of our green app that we're trying to uh, report out of committee and move forward uh, yet this year. So there are ways of, of doing this and doing it uh, very well. But I also was co-author of the Opportunity Zone legislation. And that's trying to get early stage capital in the more depressed economic regions of the, of the country. And I envisioned in doing that, teaming up with uh, Tim Scott and uh, Cory Booker in the Senate, Pat T. Berry in the House, was uh, being able to utilize renewable energy resources in opportunity zones with that early stage investment. And we're seeing that now in Wisconsin with XL Energy deploying solar farms in OZ zones that have been designated. And a lot of these are in rural areas. All of them by definition have to be in economically depressed areas. And it's usually those families that are most impacted by rising energy costs. So again, it's, it's I think a creative, innovative way of developing projects in the hard to reach, economically depressed regions of the country through the opportunity zones. And we're only limited by our imagination of where we can take these OZs, especially when it comes to energy development, sustainable, renewable energy sources. So I'm uh, excited to be uh, continuing to track that and develop that and make it a convenient option for more communities. You've mentioned jobs and workforce development, and that's a big theme of the expo today. And in fact, renewable energy and energy efficiency jobs have been on a pretty strong upward trend over the last several years, um, although uh, we have to acknowledge the awful toll that the pandemic has had. What are your priorities to strengthen clean energy workforce development in rural areas in a post-pandemic recovery period? You know, I'm getting a lot of feedback from renewable energy companies now that have huge demand and wait lists because of lack of workers. I was just on campus at one of my technical colleges, uh, Chippewa Valley Technical College, about a week ago and took a tour of their uh, renewable energy workforce development center that they're actually creating there to help produce the jobs for these renewable energy projects. And we need to support that. We need to support access to these training programs, support the technical and vocational education programs that are standing up right now in areas like mine and throughout the country in order to meet that workforce demand that we know exists because of consumer demand and people asking for more wind and solar and geothermal and energy efficient uh, projects uh, in their own backyard. So I'm again hopeful that there'll be strong public-private partnerships in this area, that we are responsive to the private sector and where the demand is coming from and where the workforce development needs uh, lie. And of course, my tech school back home in Wisconsin has shown us the way. Um, you've been very generous with your time, uh, which we really appreciate, but I have one more question that I'd like to ask. And um, over your time in Congress, um, politics and policies around many issues have changed dramatically. Yeah. Um, how is your understanding of climate change, and I'm thinking of the impacts as well as the potential solutions, evolved since you've been serving in Congress? And what, in your opinion, is different about the way policymakers and the public talk about climate change today compared to maybe when you first arrived in Congress? Well, Dan, I, I've been around a little bit, and at first, talking about climate change, trying to do anything on this front was incredibly frustrating because of how partisan and polarized the discussion was. I mean, I was around for the Clinton-Gore administration. Of course, Al Gore leading the way from the time in the Senate to the time when he was VP um, uh, and getting the word out. But I was present at the creation, so to speak, about seeing the necessity and the urgency of starting to act now before it becomes irreversible. Uh, and yet, through the years, by communicating, by getting to know my colleagues, especially across the aisle, the formation of the Climate Solutions Caucus, where you needed one R and one D to join hands, to join that bipartisan caucus, uh, the conversations opened up. And I think more people uh, realized the urgency of the moment. 
and more people back home now too. I mean, every day is a new uh, case study of the effects of climate change from the wildfires out west to the heat domes above Portland and Seattle to the perennial flooding in the upper Midwest to rising ocean and buildings starting to collapse in South Florida. I mean, all these are predictable scientific events that really requires us now to uh, uh, put politics aside and be more concerned about our children's future than about the political moment. And that's what I'm hoping this caucus will bring with your guys' help, weighing in, reaching out to various offices. I've begun, begun conversations with many of my Republican colleagues um, to, to really strengthen this caucus and the potential that we have to make significant progress. And so we can look back on history and to say, we rose to the occasion before it was too late. Thanks for that. And of course, here at ESI, we'll do whatever, whatever we can to help. And um, that's kind of our, our entire reason for, for being around. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I know it's a busy, uh, busy time in and around the House of Representatives, and we really appreciate your time. Um, and welcome to leadership uh, of the House Ener Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. I really, really look forward to working with you and your staff, who um, I'll just take a moment to thank them for um, all they've done to bring today's event. Uh, to fruition and uh, well, thanks, thanks Dan. I, I'm success. proud to join and provide the leadership we can. Olivia on my staff has been doing a terrific job too of getting the word out and working with all of you so we'll look forward to making progress in the days to come. Thank you. I wasn't going to name check Olivia but I'm glad you did. She's great. <laughs> <Okay>. I hope <laughs> thanks, she sir. doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> well it's too late now. <laughs> thanks. Great to see you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thanks. Uh, thanks to Representative Kine for uh, joining the House Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. Thanks for his leadership. Um, and thanks for the chance to chat. I really enjoyed um, our conversation and hearing about his priorities for energy efficiency and renewable energy. Um, as you can see, we're moving pretty quickly and um, I am primarily here just to keep things moving. Um, I, I joked this morning that we have 10 pounds of flour, but only a five pound bag. Um, so we're gonna keep things going pretty quickly. And to help us do that, uh, we are next going to hear from uh, Alejandro Moreno. Alejandro is Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, at the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. Um, he focuses on renewable energy and of course EERE uh, has lots and lots going on and um, almost all of it is relevant to what we're going to be talking about over the course of the afternoon. National security, cybersecurity, energy affordability, workforce development. And so um, please join me now in welcoming Alejandro Moreno to the 2021 Expo. Thanks just, uh, so much for joining us today, Alejandro. It's great to see you. Um, thanks for being part of the 2021 Clean Energy Expo. Thanks for having me. Um, I've got lots of questions for you. I know that DOE has lots of work underway and EERE in particular. Um, I'd like to start with um, a topic that one of our panels a little bit later today will address, and that is resilience in the context of national security. And I know DOE plays a big role in assuring the resilience and reliability of our energy system. Um, at EERE, how do you work with colleagues across the department to integrate energy efficiency and renewable energy resources in a way that maximizes grid resilience and reliability? This is a critical question. And, and of course, in EERE, our focus is on a lot of the emerging clean renewable technologies. And, and the Biden administration has a clear goal of decarbonizing the power sector by 2035. And we know this will involve a substantially different resource mix than we have today, including substantially more renewables like wind and solar. But at the same time, and, and hopefully this goes without saying, the primary job of the electricity system is to make sure power is available when and where it's needed affordably and reliably. And any power system structure or generation mix that doesn't do this doesn't work, full stop. Um, and so a lot of the discussion that you're hearing that we have in EERE and that we work closely with our colleagues in our Office of Electricity, for example, when we talk about integrating renewables into the power system, what we're talking about is ensuring the power system is reliable and resilient as more renewables come on. Whether we're talking about integrating renewables with storage or increasing the flexibility from generation, from clean energy generation like hydro and nuclear, or we're talking about having more flexibility or control over load. Um, and I think we have a real opportunity to do that, not just to maintain the status quo, maintain 
current levels of reliability and resilience as the grid evolves, but really to leverage some of the emerging capabilities and technologies we see to end up with a power system that really increases uh, resilience and, and reliability. And particularly in, in the face of new threats that we see, whether, uh, whether man-made cybersecurity threats or climate change related threats, um, new weather events, the wildfires, heat waves that certainly are on everybody's mind right now. Um, you know, so a, a couple examples here, I, I think, if, for example, greater distributed generation and storage can, can certainly limit the spread of power outages and help get parts of the grid back online more quickly. Um, greater observation and control of the power flow can help predict and avoid outages altogether. Um, better modeling of sub-hourly flexibility on the grid can help make sure we're siting and operating power infrastructure in a way that specifically reduces vulnerabilities. Um, and to your question, which, you know, always the, the million dollar question for a bureaucrat, how are we look at working with other, uh, other parts of, of the department? This is an essential one because all of the attributes we're talking about when we talk about reliability and resilience, these are system level properties and characteristics. Um, and so they require a deep coordination both across the OE and across the technologies themselves that, can, that, that can comprise the, the grid. Um, you don't get reliability from one particular technology working in isolation. You get it from the way multiple different elements of the system come together, um, uh, the way they're operated, the way they're planned, the way they're maintained. And so to do that requires increasing coordination always, in particular across the 11 different technology offices in EERE, whether on the load side, on the generation side, on the transportation side, with our Office of Electricity, which runs all of the actual power system, research, a lot of the power electronics research, the controls research, the microgrids research, and of course with our colleagues in our fossil office and our nuclear office, um, whose, uh, whose generation technologies continue to be, to be critical elements of the power system. Thanks. I'd like to dig into this a little bit more and move us down to sort of the community level. And at the community level, and especially in areas that are on the front lines of climate change, uh, resilience and reliability are major concerns, and especially at this time of year. And what's the potential at the community level for decentralized and distributed energy resources to keep the lights on and help communities recover from severe weather? This is, this is also critical and really goes straight to the heart of what I was saying a minute ago about the, the opportunities not only to maintain resilience in the power system, but potentially to increase it using advances in technologies and controls that, that are really becoming more cost effective and, and more prevalent on the system. Um, you know, we're, we're developing new methods and tools to, to simultaneously integrate multiple technologies um, so that we have at least the opportunity in places to evolve from a purely or predominantly centralized with command and control structure to a more de decentralized system. This is increasingly feasible and it's increasingly affordable. Um, and at the same time, I think, as you pointed out, people in communities are increasingly looking for ways to have greater control over their power supply. Uh, whether it's municipal utilities that are looking for more independence from regional providers, particularly as, as you see more and more coincidence of, of peaks in demand across many different um, sort of dependent power systems, um, or individuals who are looking for, for more independence for their own individual supply or, or communities. Um, and technologies that can help, some of them are obvious. Uh, I think rooftop solar, of course, and, and um, community level solar. As solar costs come down, this becomes more viable, particularly also as, as we increase the ability of the distribution system to accept and, and to be optimized for bi-directional flows, this becomes easier. Um, maybe some, some approaches are less obvious. We had a, a, a really interesting uh, demonstration project with Idaho Fall Power, Idaho Falls Power, excuse me, uh, recently looking at combining multiple smaller run of river hydropower projects with battery systems to increase the capacity value and, uh, uh, of the local Idaho, Idaho Falls, Falls Power fleet um, and, and reduce their dependence on, on their regional um, provider as well. And they were really happy with the results that, that we came, um, that we got out of that. Um, and some elements really involve potentially fundamentally rethinking certain elements of, of power system design and configuration. Storage is a really interesting example. I think, you know, we, we think a lot about how to value stack storage and how to incorporate it into the existing, whether policy um, sort of architecture or physical architecture of the grid. 
But it's also interesting to think about how you might use storage if you were designing a, a new system for scratch, from scratch, if you really had affordable um, electricity storage of, of four hours or more, and, and how you might build in a system where storage is, is a critical buffer and really does become as integral to uh, to the power system as transmission or, or distribution infrastructure and allow you to more effectively plan, say, for average loads rather than for, for peak loads. So these are all some of the things, different ways that, that we could see communities and smaller units of, of load or, or aggregated units of load having a little bit more control over, over their own generation and, and ultimately over the services that, that energy provides to them. That's cool, and it, it feels like we're getting closer and closer. It, it'll be it'll be nice when we're sort of we reach that sort of level of full integration. Yeah. Um, I'd like to take it down to the next level, sort of to the household level, and you know, many families spend a significant share of their monthly income on utility bills. Um, in some cases, ten percent or more, where the national average is closer to three percent. And energy burdens are often highest in rural communities, communities of color, and in tribal communities. What are some of the things EERE is doing uh, that have, um, with the goal of improving energy affordability for these families? Well, um, uh, in one way, all of the work that we do has to be targeted at affordability, right? In, in the same way that a power system that isn't reliable and resilient doesn't work, no matter its generation or its emissions profile, the same way one that doesn't provide electricity affordably doesn't work for the same reasons. That said, and, and maybe a little bit more, more usefully to your point, um, while EERE has uh, some, some very clear decarbonization goals, including reaching a fully decarbonized power sector by 2035, that's the, the president's goal, just as important are the goals related to ensuring that the clean energy transition benefits all Americans. You've heard the president and, and the administration talk a lot about the importance and the, and the opportunity for creating jobs um, in the clean energy transition, um, at the same time also addressing environmental justice past inequities um, and ensuring that the energy services and energy infrastructure benefits communities where it's located and, and where the services are provided. Um, and we know, to your point right now, that energy burdens fall hardest on low-income communities. We have extensive data-based evidence that it, both from um, our own low-income energy affordability data tool, our lead tool, as well as analysis on, on U.S. Census data, um, showing that how rural communities and, and also communities of color are disproportionately affected by high energy burdens. Um, rural communities specifically have, have a higher median energy burden than urban households, um, and it's worth noting that those disparities increase substantially for minority communities um, and individuals, households rather, elderly, um, and also those who rent. Um, and so it's a critical part of our mission in DOE and EERE to reduce those disparities, um, as well as reducing energy burden overall. Um, DOE has a new Office of Energy Justice that helps lead this effort, um, and the President's new Justice 40 initiative promises to deliver 40% of the overall benefits of climate change investments to disadvantaged communities. And that's something that we are taking very seriously, is a key part of how we are determining where we spend our money, where we request money for, um, to Congress for, for the work that we will continue to do in, in the upcoming fiscal years. Um, and these investments are really targeted on ensuring that the communities that have suffered the consequences of a high energy burden, the consequences of, of poverty, um, really are the first to benefit. And EERE has a, has a number of programs that have historically included a focus on uh, low-income communities and, and otherwise disadvantaged communities, including programs like our weatherizations, uh, assist, weatherization assistance program. This is the nation's largest whole house energy efficiency retrofit program, um, and it focuses on disadvantaged American families on a national scale, providing energy efficiency retrofits to about 35,000 low-income families in, in every county and, and I think every, every state uh, every year. Um, Another program within the weatherization or, or broader weatherization office is our state energy program, which strategically engages state leadership um, in deploying clean energy technologies and, and increasingly can be leveraged to, to create programs that focus specifically on disadvantaged communities. Um, within our, our renewable energy programs as well, we're increasingly focused on programs that specifically look at some of the barriers to access for low-income communities. For example, rooftop solar is very difficult to deploy if you don't own your own home. And so how do we look at financing models, 
and, and structural models, physical structural models that allow, for example, communities to invest in their own solar at, at a slightly more aggregated level where the financing structure is something that allows low income communities and low income individuals and households to participate um, while seeing the same benefits and, and ensuring that the individuals and the households accrue the same benefit that they might from cell phone rooftop solar on, on, a, on an owned house, uh, for example. Um, let's dig into the, the jobs issue a little bit since you, you mentioned it and weatherization and state energy program, I, I tend to think of as, as jobs programs as much as anything. Um, job growth in the energy efficiency and renewable energy sectors has been on a strong upward trend over the past several years. And of course that was pretty severely interrupted by the pandemic, um, but there's a recovery taking place. What are EERE's priorities to strengthen clean energy workforce development? Um, I, I think, I, I, as I said before, we have an opportunity as we tr transition to a clean energy power system and a clean energy economy to create thousands and thousands of new, good, well-paying jobs and stable clean energy careers that have potential for growth, potential potentially to join a union. Um, this will be essential to the success of, of the green energy transition and, and is a huge opportunity for the American economy overall. Um, EERE does have, a, I think, a critical role to play here as we are the, the technology experts. Um, traditionally, we've done a fair amount of workforce training work, but I think we all recognize that if we are going to be successful in not only in, in, in ensuring that um, skilled workers are, are available, but the jobs are available in there, that it takes more than just training. Training is a, a critical element, but we need to take as, as DOE and, um, and as the clean energy sector, a, a more holistic approach. Um, I think starting from education and really ensuring um, robust STEM programs, related STEM programs, ensuring diversity and inclusion within those programs to make sure we are drawing from all of the talent that America has to offer. Drawing connections between those programs, the educational programs, and the industries um, and the sectors that are creating jobs themselves. Um, and there's a role there, I think, for, for the DOE and for the federal government in partnership with both private sector institutions and universities themselves to ensure that we're developing really thorough and robust networks between a wide range of universities and the increasing number of companies in the clean energy sector. Um, of course, the training and, and ensuring continued skills development, both from a, a STEM perspective and from a vocational training perspective is important, but also creating um, certifications that allow for a level of technical standards and labor standards in the jobs themselves, so that we, as jobs develop, there's, there's a set, there's an element of, of both quality assurance but also predictability and stability in those jobs that, that the customer and, and the recipient of the work uh, and the technology know what they're getting, uh, but the workers know exactly what they're getting as well um, and can train for that. And then lastly, and, and potentially most importantly, it's making sure that, that the parts of the industry that create those jobs, create those jobs here in the US. Um, and you can have all the workers in the world, but if you don't have the jobs, um, in the U.S., then, then you're not going to see that same benefit to the local American communities that you need. And that's a big part you know, of what we're looking at. For example, if, if we look at some of the, the estimates of the amount of, of wind turbines or, or solar panels um, and solar capacity that needs to come online every year between now and 2035 to increase, uh, I'm sorry, to, um, to meet the, the president's climate goals, that could entail a, a, a doubling or tripling of, of of, say, wind um, capacity, wind manufacturing every year. How do we ensure that that stays in the U.S. or, or the, the majority of that or the, the components that are most productively developed in the U.S. are developed here and, the, and that the, we're not losing job opportunities um, where it doesn't make sense to, uh, to, to other countries or um, otherwise losing opportunity really to create that, um, that, uh, those opportunities for the workforce here. I mentioned at the outset that one of our panels later today will deal with national security and resilience and climate. We also have a panel coming up later that will deal with workforce development, job um, economic development, job creation. 
uh, in the renewable energy and energy efficiency sector. So um, thanks very much for that answer. I'm looking forward to what our industry representatives have to say about it too. Yeah. Um, you have a lot of experience and expertise in renewable energy. Um, I come from a background that's defined more by energy efficiency. Um, how should these two good things work better together? And specifically, how does EERE think about energy efficiency and renewable energy um, in the building sector? Um, so again, this, this, again, great question. And it really goes back to the principle of, of integrated systems that I, I talked about at the beginning, I think, in, in, in the first question. Um, you know, my focus has is, is really been focused on, on decarbonizing the grid. Um, and I recognize that as, as important as renewable energy generation technologies are, we're not going to get there without the load side either. Um, and part of this is in the efficiency itself, traditional efficiency measures, um, particularly reducing peak demand, which is, of course, a driver for the scale of the generation infrastructure you need. Um, at the same time, advances in, in smart appliances and building technologies all, also offer the opportunity to provide a lot of um, flexibility back to the grid. So there's a real opportunity space there for adjusting aggregate demand on the fly in response to changes in, in generation output. So instead of this traditional sort of paradigm of, of just constantly adjusting generation to meet fairly sort of standard load patterns or load patterns that are, that are taken as a given, being able to adjust both sides of the equation dynamically offers you a lot more control in um, ensuring reliability and, and resilience and affordability at lower overall costs with lower overall infrastructure um, requirements. Um, and we have a lot of work in, in EERE focused on that. Our, our great interactive uh, buildings um, program in our buildings technology office, for example, that's a primary focus, but it works really closely with, with the renewable energy technologies as well, right? Uh, particularly with behind the meter technologies, rooftop solar, behind the meter storage is an integral component to the load side flexibility as well. And so at some point, the, that rigid distinction between the building's envelope and, and appliances and the grid becomes pretty gray and you need to work closely across the suite of technologies, again, understanding how they integrate at different points in the grid chain, whether behind the meter, at the substation level, at the bulk level. Um, but, you know, whether it's buildings or transportation, I think maybe even the biggest element of integration is really looking at the projected electrification of loads that are currently served by fuel or by thermal energy. Um, as we know, many automakers are looking to have most, if not all, of their new models be EVs by 2035 or so. Um, and decarbonizing heavy industry is going to require a mix of both electrification and, and zero carbon fuels. Um, and this will have a major effect on the demands that are put on the power system. We know that it's yeah, it, 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 I think it's the, the problem statement is fairly well acknowledged, but understanding the nuances of the implications of different sequencing, scales, pace of electrification of different subsectors is something we're just starting to really wrestle with. Um, you know, just to give an example, understanding the true flexibility of different types of demand. For example, what percentage of people are going to be willing to have their cars charged at three in the morning instead of six o'clock when they come home and plug them in? Or how much flexibility will UPS's delivery trucks have to charge it not, uh, during the day and deliver at night? Um, these are actually, given the scale that we're talking about here in aggregate, these are really important questions. They may very, have significant implications on the generation side and build out. And they also take a, a type of um, technical knowledge that's, that's relatively new for the power sector. It's a lot of consumer behavior, for example, psychology, um, these are going to be important factors in understanding the full integration of the power system with load and beginning to move from, you know, sort of siloed IRP resource planning, generation planning, transition, transmission planning into more holistic, uh, integrated energy planning. A number of utilities are starting to do this. It's, it's certainly a way I think we, an approach we are, we're very supportive of. Um, but it, it requires a level of coordination and a level of, of understanding and knowledge across multiple disciplines within the power sector, within the energy sector, that, that is, is relatively new and, and going to be more and more important as we move forward. Well, Alejandro, you've been super generous with your time, but I do have one more question for you. It's something we haven't covered yet, but I'm interested in hearing what EERE is doing. Um, and I'm going to refer back to one of our congressional climate camp briefings, and we sort of specifically looked at the emissions profile of the industrial sector. 
and why it's so important to decarbonize the processes we use to make stuff. Um, what is EERE doing to help industrial producers and manufacturers reduce their carbon footprints? This is another, another great question and another great example of a sector that really cuts across many different technologies and many different offices within DOE. Of course, within EERE, we have our advanced manufacturing office, which has a large focus on industrial decarbonization. It actually started life as, as the industrial technologies program, um, but we have a lot of work within our fuel cells program, looking at hydrogen, for example, in our bioenergies program, looking at, at um, new combustion turbines that can um, be optimized for renewable energy fuels. And of course, also within our nuclear and within our fossil energy and, and carbon, man carbon management program, a lot of the work is, is looking either at individual technologies or integrated energy systems that have a real potential value for industrial decarbonization. Some of that, I will say, there, there's, we are looking at, at hybrid systems that can um, both support industrial decarbonization and the grid at the same time and offer more flexibility back to the grid. But really looking at industry and heavy industry itself, um, I mean, we are looking, and we need to look at the efficiency of the processes themselves. We need to look at opportunities for electrification, increased electrification. Of, of multiple different um, currently thermal power processes. Uh, we need to look at hydrogen and other heat thermal sources, so thermal sources, hydrogen for um, processes that are not well suited for electrification. We know there are a lot. Um, and so we're looking at, a, at a, a sort of a sector by sector, looking at chemicals, looking at steel, looking at cement, for example, and really recognizing that, that each one is different. Each one has their own needs, each one has their own cost drivers. And so working with, you know, within ERE, our, our manufacturing office taking the lead in working directly with, with uh, industrial stakeholders themselves, but being able to, to bring the full range of technologies that we have, again, from a generation side, from a storage side, and from efficiency side to bear. Um, we are uh, continuing to develop strategic plans specifically for industrial decarbonization. It's one of the, the five um, key priorities you see out, coming out of the ERE. Probably should have talked about those at the beginning, but, but the first is decarbonizing the, the power sector, reaching a fully decarbonized power sector by 2035. The second is focused on decarbonizing the transportation sector, the third on buildings, the fourth on, on industry, industrial decarbonization, and, and the fifth on agriculture. Um, and what's really important about all of those, if, if you know EERE well, they don't perfectly align to our offices or even to our sectors. And again, it's a recognition that all of this work is cross-cutting and it requires integration of multiple different technologies focused on specific end uses, because that's ultimately where our stakeholders reside, where the benefits will accrue, um, and the people that we need to be working with and listening to to make sure that the technologies and the solutions we provide work for them. And if they don't work for them, then they don't work, period. So. Well, you just said something along the lines of, for people who are familiar with EERE, it's impossible for anyone who just listened to the last few minutes uh, not learn so much about EERE. It's so much great work going on over there at the Department of Energy. And um, you've been, again, extremely generous with your time to join us today for the expo. Um, thank you so much. I only wish we could be together in person. Um, so um, hopefully next year uh, we'll be able to have an in-person expo. But um, on behalf of everyone, um, thank you so much for joining us today and telling us all about your great work at EERE. I really appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me. It was a pleasure and wish you the best for the rest of the show. Great. Thanks so much. Take care. Great. Well, special thanks to Alejandro for making so much time uh, available for us today. It was a great conversation and um, definitely enjoyed speaking with him. There's so much going on at DOE um, and EERE. Um, we are now at the point in our program where uh, we will have our first panel uh, of the day. What does climate change mean for national security? Um, I will introduce the panel as we go, um, uh, and uh, we'll have a little bit of time for discussion. But to help us welcome the panelists, um, I would like to introduce uh, Caucus Deputy Co-Chair Senator Susan Collins, the senior senator for Maine. Uh, she is a key appropriator. She also serves on the Special Committee on Aging, the Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions, and the Select Committee on Intelligence. So let's welcome Senator Susan Collins. Thank you, Daniel. It is a pleasure to welcome our distinguished panel. I thank my colleagues in the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus 
for your commitment to bipartisan action on the challenge of climate change. There's no question that climate change presents a serious threat to the security and prosperity of our world. Here at home, the effects of climate change could damage our economy, harm public health, and overwhelm disaster response. In addition, climate change poses a direct threat to our national defense. In 2019, the Pentagon reported that two-thirds of military installations surveyed were already facing risks related to climate change, such as flooding, drought, and wildfires. We must take action on two fronts. First, it is essential that we build greater resilience into our critical infrastructure, such as our power grid and water supplies. Second, we must continue to make investments in the clean, renewable energy sources that help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. The Energy Act of 2020 that became law late last year demonstrates the progress we can make when we work together. From increasing energy efficiency to supporting renewable energy production and storage, this comprehensive package keeps our nation at the forefront of clean energy development. Clean energy is vital to our future, our economy, and our environment. Thank you for the important work you do to help our nation stay positioned as a global leader on combating climate change. Thanks, Senator Collins, for helping us introduce our panel today. What does national security, or excuse me, what does climate change mean uh, for national security? Um, we have assembled um, a really um, amazing collection of leaders and experts and practitioners uh, to help us get to the bottom of this uh, question to the extent that we can uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, I'm going to open the panel uh, by introducing our first speaker. Uh, we will be hearing from Joe Bryan, Senior Advisor for Climate, and he works with the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense at the Defense Department. Joe, welcome to our panel today. Thanks so much, Dan. It's a uh, it's a it's a great opportunity to be here. Thanks for the uh, the opportunity to join and and to be with some uh, some old friends and some new faces. I see with my uh, my fellow panelists. So uh, as Dad mentioned, my my name is Joe Bryan, and I'm the senior climate advisor to the Secretary of Defense. And um, you know, some have asked why the Secretary of Defense actually needs a climate advisor. What does climate have to do with national security? And uh, my answer to that is the same one as Secretary Austin's, and that is that there is little about what the department does to defend the American people that is not affected by climate change. Just look around the world. The Arctic is warming at a rate twice as fast as the rest of the planet, heating up competition for, heating up, uh, competition for resources and influence. Uh, extended drought in Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala contributes to migration north to our southern border. Longer hurricane and typhoon seasons impact operations. In fact, Typhoon Wutip in February 2019 forced us to pause exercises with our Australian and Japanese partners. You know, in April, Secretary Austin hosted a panel as part of President Biden's Climate Leaders Summit. And the Iraqi Minister of Defense said at that panel, quote, put simply, Iraq is very hot and it's getting hotter. He called climate change, quote, an existential threat to Iraq's national security, and talked about how ISIS understands that vulnerability and has targeted water resources, including the Mosul Dam, as a way to undermine the government. The challenges to security and stability posed by climate change are real and they're significant. They are mission generators demanding attention and resources. And the same phenomenon that drives mission demand also challenges our capacity to respond. We sortie ships in the face of hurricanes. We evacuate installation in the face of installations in the face of wildfires. Just look at what's happening out west right now. There have been evacuations of Beale Air Force Base and Camp Pendleton Marine Corps Base in just the last month. We have black flag days when it's too hot to train. 
It was over 130 degrees in Death Valley a couple weeks ago. Uh, and the heat wave in the Pacific Northwest actually shut down Puget Sound Naval Shipyard. That's, that's Puget Sound. Hurricane Michael wiped out Tyndall Air Force Base in 2018, causing $5 billion in damage. Lejeune had more than $3 billion in damage from the same storm. Flooding of the Missouri River in March of 2019 caused more than $400 million of damage at Offutt Air Force Base. In this spring, I was with Deputy Secretary Hicks at Naval Air Station Pensacola, which suffered about $450 million in damages from Hurricane Sally, and that was just last fall. The base when we visited had 27 football fields of temporary blue roofing covering their facilities. Climate change is going to cost us in resources and readiness. The reality is that it already is. We need to make sure that we're prepared for the impacts of climate, always with a focus on the mission. But as Secretary Austin has said many times, our mission objectives are actually quite well aligned with our climate goals. There is not, I repeat, there is not a competition between what's good for the climate and what's good for the mission. Look, our military bases house critical missions that need to stay up and running, even if the grid goes down. When we have a threat environment from weather and cyber, just think about the Pioneer pipeline attack a few, from a few weeks ago, that put the grid at risk. And what do you do to improve mission resilience? Well, number one, you get really energy efficient. And number two, you bring energy storage and distributed generation inside the base fence line, preferably things like solar that minimize logistics requirements. And you put controls in place that make sure resources are directed at the right assets. You don't want to keep the lights in the gym on when the mission's suffering from lack of power. Look, I was out at Marine Corps Air Station Miramar in California just a few weeks ago. That base has a microgrid capable of powering critical missions, even should they lose grid power. To get there, they leverage a range of assets from landfill gas to solar. And last summer, Miramar actually took six megawatts of power off the grid to help the local utility deal with exceptionally high demand during a heat wave and preserve the grid for everyone. We need more of that capability. And that's why President Biden's budget request proposed significant increases for programs like the Energy Resilience and Conservation Improvement Fund to strengthen base resilience. Now, it's important to recognize that two-thirds to three-quarters of our energy is actually used on things like ships and airplanes, not our bases. And reducing energy demand is not only good for the climate, it is critical for military operations. The joint warfighting concept includes four concepts, command and control, fires, information advantage, and contested logistics. We know that we're not going to get a free pass to push fuel into theater. So we can't be aggressive enough in reducing operational energy demand. After all, you can't sink efficiency. The president's budget proposed new investments in key operational energy programs from hybrid electric tactical vehicles to engine improvements on Navy ships to reducing airplane drag to improve fuel efficiency. These investments are a priority because again, they're great for the mission and also happen to be quite good for the climate. Finally, the president has made domestic lithium ion battery production a priority, and that effort is tied closely to electric vehicle deployment. You may have seen the executive order calls for electrification of the federal fleet. Now you might ask, what does that have to do with national security? And while it may not be immediately intuitive, the commercial EV industry is actually critical to DOD capability. The scale and pace of the shift to electric transportation is massive and fast. Volvo is committed to be all electric by 2030, GM by 2035, Ford in Europe by 2030, and Volkswagen will have 70 new electric models and 50% of the US and Chinese markets targeted for electric by 2030. Lithium ion batteries are at the heart of the transformation to EVs. And estimates are that to date, around $750 billion has been committed for investment in the lithium ion battery supply chain. But right now, China dominates that supply chain. And that's a problem because military capability depends on batteries. The Navy alone has two to 3,000 systems that rely on lithium ion batteries. And future capability from unmanned systems to directed energy weapons all rely 
on lithium ion. It is the commercial sector, however, that will drive supply chain investment. DOD is a big customer, but can't move that market on its own. We need the commercial EV industry to drive supply chain investment back to the United States. Again, EV deployment, good for the climate, but also necessary for the mission. I'll end with this thought. The world is changing, and the climate and clean energy challenge and opportunity raise issues that we need to engage. And the choices we make matter to the climate, but they're also crucial to the military's success. Thank you, and I look forward to the conversation. Thanks so much, Joe, for getting the panel um, off on a great start. Uh, our next panelist we will be hearing from is Lisa Jacobson. Uh, Lisa is president of the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. Welcome to the panel, Lisa. Thank you, Dan. It's a pleasure to be with you once again, and congratulations on an amazing program of this year. And I'm very pleased to be part of this panel today where we're focused on national security and resilience. You know, and following uh, the previous comments, you know, just like the military, the private sector, which I represent, is deeply impacted by disruptions to supply chains, and we are involved for a number of reasons. So I think the national security frame, which you don't often hear from the business community as the lead, is a really important topic to discuss. You know, just thinking about the Business Council for Sustainable Energy's experience, that the organization was founded nearly 30 years ago on the cusp of the Rio Earth Summit. And through those discussions, the businesses that I represent realize we not only have you know, technologies and expertise to share, but we also have a national imperative to participate because while we can work here at home and abroad to reduce emissions and to improve our resilience, we have a larger challenge in front of us, which is you know, the safety and security of populations throughout the world. So there's a moral impetitive to make sure that we have a secure, safe, and thriving world for our citizens and families and communities to help, help and, and contribute. So from a business perspective, national security is a very important topic. So when we look at it, we think about our goods and services and our supply chains, as I already mentioned, and we look at it from the lens of community and you know, individual uh, safety and prosperity. I also wanna talk a little bit about resilience. And here too, we look at it both here at home and what we can offer abroad. The impacts of climate change are severe and unfortunately increasing. You know, this is one of the areas that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy tracks in a report it releases each year called the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook. Just a few years ago, we started a new section on resilience um, and resilient investment and how the clean energy technologies and services that Business Council for Sustainable Energy members offer are expanding. And unfortunately, that section you know, continues to get larger and larger as the, the frequency and severity of the episodes are happening in our country and in others and the expenditures that we have to make to rebuild um, and, and hopefully to a larger extent invest upfront before we're having these disasters increases. So resilience, national security and US competitiveness, I think are all interwoven and certainly top of mind for the companies and industries that the Business Council represents. One of the aspects that we try to offer in this conversation is obviously the need to prioritize investment to support our national security as it relates to climate change and to invest uh, in more resilient infrastructure, but to do so with the private sector in mind and really trying to use any public activity or public investment as a vehicle to leverage private sector activity. I know we're gonna talk about this a little bit more when we hear from Tim Unruh, uh, the executive director of NAESCO, but I wanted to point it out because I think that's one of the top messages that the Business Council for Sustainable Energy is trying to put forward to policymakers. You know, our challenges um, 
are ones that are so significant that we can't do it alone. There really needs to be public-private partnership. So with that, again, I, I'll conclude by saying that national security is vital to U.S. companies. We need to have stable markets here at home, and many of our industries operate in the global marketplace. So when we're thinking about the geopolitical aspects of climate change and the need for stable markets abroad, it has a direct impact on jobs and investment here in the United States too. So the business community looks to help find ways with its technology and expertise to enhance our national security and to contribute to conversations that will enable us to leverage the private sector in these areas so that we can achieve our goals more affordably and faster. Thanks, Dan. Well, thanks to you, Lisa, for joining us today. Um, and uh, you sort of took away um, uh, my ability to introduce our next panelist, but I'll let it go this one time. Uh, no. He'll get two introductions today. Um, but if anyone's going to get two introductions, it might as well be Tim Unruh, Executive Director of the National Association of Energy Services Companies. Tim, thanks for joining us again this year at the 2021 Expo. Yeah. Tim, I'm I'm sorry, we're having a little hard time understanding you. Um, do you think maybe it sounds like your microphone may not be connected? How about now? Can you hear me now? It's a little bit better now, but I'll say a little bit. Okay. Well, I'll try it just a little bit louder. Does that work now? It's still pretty touch and go. Still I'll pretty try touch and go. Directly. Oh, hands it. We're getting a little bit of interference. It sounds like now we have some typing. Um, could you try right. again, Tim? Sounds like you're very far away. Um, is any better yet? Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. It does not count against your time. All right, it worked fine in our preview. <laughs> I don't think I changed. So it's great to be here today, and thanks, Lisa, for the call out from uh, BCSC. And I, it's nice to get to work with so many people that I've worked with prior, and to be on this panel with them. And uh, it uh, looks like a great turnout for you today, Dan. So wonderful, congratulations. Um, as mentioned by Lisa uh, before, I want to expand on the topic of, of a public-private partnership called Energy Safety Performance Contracts, or ESPCs. This type of contract has been around for about 40 years now, and enabling legislation is in place for the federal government and every state government in the U.S., and about $7 billion of work is done under this type of agreement with the private sector every year. And since infrastructure is the hot topic in Washington this week, I want to explain how ESPCs are a unique tool <clears throat> that, that we use in renewing and modernizing our public facilities, a tool that's enjoyed broad bipartisan support across the country for the last 30 years. In my recent history, I ran the Federal Energy Management Program in the U.S. Department of Energy. One of our roles was to manage energy savings performance contracts. During my tenure, we saw two significant achievements using these contracts that greatly benefited the American taxpayer. The first achievement was the President's Performance Contracting Challenge. In that challenge, each federal agency accepted a goal to implement ESPCs over a five-year period. Through active agency leadership, some of those leaders are here on this call today, and consistent engagement through White House Council on Environmental Quality, we were able to implement $4 billion, actually over $4 billion in federal facility improvements. And let's be clear, that is $4 billion of private sector investment into federal facilities. In the second achievement, a new program was started called AFFECT. And as you can guess, we love those acronyms. And this is another one. It stands for Assisting Federal Facilities with Energy Conservation Technologies, or that's where we get AFFECT. Congress established this program to allow federal agencies to compete for grants by proposing plans to leverage the grants into agency-wide energy savings performance contract programs. 
rather than one-off ESPC projects. We started small with about $3 million of grants the first year because we didn't know if agencies would really like the idea. And we were delighted that agencies submitted proposals and that the winning proposals leveraged the $3 million of grants to about $75 million of programs, a 25 times multiplier of federal funds from, with private investment. How do we get these astounding results? It's really pretty simple, actually. Unlike other public-private partnerships, which allow an increased fees or taxes to repay the private investors, ESPCs repurpose money that a public facility is already spending on wasted energy and the maintenance of obsolete equipment to a stream of guaranteed savings to repay the investors. And these are very safe investments with extremely low default rates, most of which are held by long-term institutional investors. But neither the public nor the private halves of this partnership are resting on our achievement of over $60 billion of performance projects to date. We're all working continuously to improve ESPC. On the public side, the Department of Energy develops and refines a set of standard contract processes and documents, now in its third generation and posted on the DOE website, as well as developing and maintaining a database of more than 7,000 ESPC projects that documents the success of ESPCs. And state energy offices develop program regulations and processes to help state facilities, local governments, K-12 schools, universities, and water wastewater facilities to better utilize these, these contracts. The private sector has also made improvements with NASCO collaborating with DOE and state efforts to improve performance contracts and establish an accreditation program that enables customers to identify high quality ESCOs. There's even an organization that provides a coordination between the private sector and state energy offices called the Energy Services Coalition. As you can see, we've developed this industry significantly. Now, how does this relate to resiliency? As we face the task of rebuilding our public facilities infrastructure, we're learning that we must expand the use of performance contracts because there is not going to be enough government funding to get the job done. We have learned, for example, that energy efficiency improvements are interrelated with many necessary resilience improvements. An example is that new windows and doors not only have to minimize air leakage, but they also have to be wind resistant, hurricane resistant, and they might even need to be blast resistant. In another case, when a facility wants to install a system for peak energy use reduction, they may also decide that they want to install a microgrid to improve the facility's ability to survive a power outage or to make sure the facility can be used for emergency shelter. We also see that many pandemic-related building improvements are also tied to energy efficiency, like ventilation and UVC lighting sanitation. These resilience plus efficiency measures share one thing in common. The efficiency portion provides sufficient savings to pay for itself, but the resiliency add-on does not. This puts building owners into a quandary, and they recognize if they do the efforts together, they have significant opportunity to reduce overall costs, but if they have to do them separately, they know that the resilient measures may never be done. For this reason, the National Association of Energy Service Companies is asking Congress to take advantage of the financial leverage offered by ESPCs. We believe that a resilient down payment can be leveraged with ESPCs to get more done with less. We believe that for every dollar invested by Congress, we would expect at least $4 to be invested by the private sector. Let's be clear. Our our four times leverage estimate is a modest expectation as this proposal is modeled after the federal affect program. While its initial offering saw a 25 times achievement, the program consistently performs at at least 10 times leveraging every year. We believe that as federal, state, and local governments across the country recognize the need for resilient improvements in their building infrastructure, they're going to find that leveraging their investment with energy savings performance contracts will lower their building's emissions while making them better ready to weather whatever type of storm is next. I look forward to hearing what others have to say on this topic today, Dan. Awesome, Tim, thank you so much. And apologies for the, um, um, the, the technical issue at the, at the start, but I can assure you I heard everything that you said after that. It was great, thank you. I, I'm sure it's my fault anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't, I, it's over with now. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tim. Um, our next speaker uh, is uh, an old and dear friend to EESI, John Conger, the director of the Senate, excuse me, director of the Center for Climate and Security. John, welcome to the expo today. Really looking forward to your presentation.
John, you may be muted on your end. Okay. Well, yep. can you hear me now? All right, good. Um, so thanks for inviting me. Thanks for including me in this presentation. It's very exciting uh, to have this panel today on what we consider to be a very important topic, the, uh, the intersection between national security and climate change, which is obviously the, the meat and potatoes of our, of our center. Um, I think if, if I could have one thing that the audience would take away from uh, today's session from all the panelists, it's that climate change is a national security issue. It affects how DOD operates and plans, it impacts infrastructure, it affects human security and safety, and it affects global stability. Uh, by its nature, it means that uh, what you've always done isn't good enough and that your planning assumptions have to change. Uh, the, uh, the incomparable Joe Bryan uh, went through all of these details uh, you know, earlier on in his presentation. So I'm not gonna repeat all of the different ways that climate change is going to impact uh, national security, but I do want to leave you with a second takeaway. Uh, if you have two takeaways, in addition to climate change is a national security issue, I want you to take away that more than an, almost any other aspect of climate policy, climate security has been an increasingly, and to some people surprisingly, bipartisan and pragmatic space. At the, at the Center for Climate and Security, we've been working to promote this consensus for many years. We have an advisory board of retired admirals and generals who've all recognized this underlying premise. And that the underlying premise, your first takeaway. But back in 2017, uh, I think we saw really the potential of this because Congress uh, in a bipartisan vote declared climate change was a direct threat to national security. Now let's remember uh, what the situation was in 2017. We had a, a Republican House, a Republican Senate, President Trump, and all of them came together to make this declaration. Um, you know, but there was a House floor vote where 46 Republicans joined all the Democrats to affirm uh, this uh, provision, and it was kept in conference in the Defense Authorization Bill and signed by the President. And you know, when when that you know, generally when uh, the bill is pending before the President, they come out with um, the statements of administration policy, and that statement of administration policy didn't the climate provisions. So I think it's important to recognize that this was something that had broad agreement at the very least uh, within the defense space. And then the following year, uh, the House and Senate Armed Services Committees continued to include pragmatic measures into defense legislation, resilience measures, Arctic strategy. You know, when you have a whole new ocean to patrol, that changes the strategic calculation. And with the Arctic ice melting, that's what, that's what you've got. Um, the kinds of provisions that basically recognize that DOD has a stake in climate change, and we don't want to impose a blind spot on them that would make them more vulnerable. Heck, in, in December of 2018, Senator Inhofe, who has a reputation as a climate skeptic, uh, commented to the media that while climate wasn't his priority, he was not going to try and block measures from appearing in the National Defense Authorization Act if they were going to help the military. Well, he was about to become the chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. So you sort of get a sense of the, the acceptance of this issue. Um, the Washington Post uh, saw this pattern and published a piece noting that if you wanted President Trump to sign climate legislation, all you had to do was put it in a defense bill. Uh, DOD has put out policy on how to incorporate climate change into infrastructure programs, published studies on the vulnerability of DOD bases, uh, there was a, a science study that, that was uh, uh, 2018 where uh, they assessed the vulnerability of a uh, base in the Pacific, noting that um, there was going to be, because of sea level rise, the, you know, this was a radar facility in Kwajalein, that by the 2030s, uh, it might not be able to operate because the island wouldn't be able to support human habitation. And those kinds of studies are really important because it wasn't that the base was going to be underwater. It was that the, uh, the aquifer was going to be polluted with salt water. The sea level rise hits other things before you're walking, walking in water across the, uh, the installation. And so you had to be able to have that fresh water. So, so um, the point is, is that DOD has been doing these things for a long time under Republicans and Democrats. You can reach back to the Bush administration and find highlighting this issue, find studies highlighting this issue. Uh, you can 
back down back to the Bush administration again to repeated worldwide threat assessments by the intelligence community that state that uh, climate change is a national security issue. Um, in 2020, the Secretary of the Army issued a climate change directive. And uh, they had also, they finally finished their Army climate assessment tool, which was the predecessor to the DCAP, the Defense Climate Assessment Tool that Joe mentioned. The, 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 over those years, I think one of the reasons that such bipartisan consensus has emerged was because of the billions of dollars in, of impacts that extreme weather events have had. Um, when Congress has to start writing checks, everything becomes real and it's no longer an issue of debate. But when you have to write $5 billion check for uh, Tyndall Air Force Base or $3.6 billion for Camp Lejeune or um, Joe also mentioned the the Offutt Air Force Base uh, damage from the flooding of the Missouri River. I think pragmatism emerges when the impacts are clear. And so you had Republicans and Democrats coming together in Congress, and you had Republicans and Democrats across administrations buying into this issue. So what's different? Well, I'll tell you what's different. It makes a significant difference when senior leadership prioritizes a topic or a portfolio. And, and that is certainly what the current administration has done. Without question, <clears throat> the threat imposed by climate change has been prioritized by this administration. Uh, but without question, it is clear that it is one of Secretary Austin's top priorities. And, and I think that that has sent a shockwave and momentum through the department. Um, and that came from the president. So it's shockwaves through the rest of the administration as well. Um, I think it's important to recognize that what interests your boss fascinates you, and that has taken hold at DOD and across the enterprise. But it's really at the heart of the effort. It's about pragmatism. It's about taking it out of politics, setting it aside from politics, recognizing the risks, and trying to take commensurate action. You know, Congress is continuing to work this issue, and I expect to see uh, more provisions in the defense authorization bills, more provisions in the appropriations bills. Uh, you hear during, uh, you know, during a appropriations committee hearing, a House appropriations committee hearing earlier this year, um, you heard bipartisan support and interest in the issue. It was it was a Republican in that hearing who mentioned that uh, President Biden needed a bigger emphasis uh, on uh, climate in his defense strategy. So I'll I'll wrap up. Um, we've definitely turned a corner. And in the past few years, Congress has stopped arguing about scientific consensus and facts and having non-scientists argue with non-scientists about scientific issues and working on how to respond. Uh, there are lots of reasons for that. But one of them is the bridge building that occurred through the national security sector and, uh, and the fact that it has helped us step aside from the political debates and turn to pragmatism uh, and, and be able to move the ball forward to figure out how we protect uh, our military and our national security from the impacts of climate change. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, John. That was a great presentation and a, a great um, summary of sort of how to look at this. I love the um, um, I love the emphasis on pragmatism. I think that really, um, especially with with what we're seeing in the headlines, um, you know, I think that really hits home. So thank you so much for your presentation. Um, next up, we will hear from Beth Gibbons. Beth is Executive Director of the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, or ASAP. Beth, welcome to the panel. Thanks so much, Dan. And I really can't imagine having a better tee up from what John just said, because at ASAP, we really talk about our work being pragmatic optimism. We try to remain optimists in the face of immense climate challenges and looking at what needs to be done. And I would say that, you know, John's remarks and also the Washington Post article that came out this weekend that said, we have enough studies, we need to set targets, but we need to do adaptation today is really where ASAP comes in. Um, our organization is a network of professionals across North America who come from multiple sectors, from academia, nonprofits, from the government and philanthropy, to identify how do we actually do cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral work to address the impacts of climate change. And when we talk about that, when we bring people together from all of these different sectors, what's defining that work is that we're talking about integrating future climate 
conditions into our day-to-day -day work. And it's so critical. I mean, the reasons that we've already heard, climate risk is posed to our health, our security, our economy, our infrastructure. In 2020, there were $22 billion or greater disasters. Already in 2021, we've seen $8 billion disasters. And so we say, why does climate adaptation matter? Because just as we've already heard, that when those bills start to get come due and they are coming due, we need to come up with mechanisms to prevent them. And that is really where climate adaptation actions come in. Climate adaptation introduces new thinking. It's asking for you to think about things in ways that are iterative, collaborative, interdisciplinary. And in all of this work, we're really asking for climate adaptation solutions to be people-centric and future-oriented. We need to break our paradigm that we are going to plan for the weather or the system of yesterday. We need to start looking forward and we have to start being strategic. And so when we think about that, we think about who are some of the best strategists we have among our minds. And we turn to DOD and we've seen the Department of Defense in so many ways already leading in this area. We see collaborations that have taken place from San Diego to Colorado into the Hampton Roads region. And it makes sense because the same study that John was alluding to earlier, that 2018 study of the Pacific base included 3,500 bases and half of those bases identified that they were considering climate as one of their top risks. In some cases, it was flood. In some cases, it was saltwater intrusion. In some cases, it was wildfire. But we know that the bases are thinking about it already. And so when we want to imagine what could this look like as a solution, we have some really great places to turn. And so I'm gonna tell a, a short story of a place-based case where whole government coordination came to play a role in changing what is happening today and what's gonna happen into the future. And I'm sure many people on this call already know this story is from the Hampton Roads area. And so when you imagine Hampton Roads there on the tip of Virginia, you can see 1.7 million people. You see one of the world's most impressive natural deep water ports, and you have the most military installations of any place in the USA. So a place that has sensitivity, opportunity, and multiple reasons that we're going to need to be protecting this place. Back in 2014, they launched the Hampton Roads Resilience Integrated Pilot Project, which you'll never need to know the name of if you wanna call it shorthand, it's the IPP. And this effort brought together players from really, uh, I'm gonna repeat this again, a whole of government approach. And I'm gonna repeat that because we're hearing the current administration talk about a whole of government approach, but I think that their whole of government is thinking about the federal family. And at the Hampton Roads, all of government, whole of government approach, it was the local government, a regional body, the state government, and then they brought in federal partners. It was DOD, it was Army Corps, it was FEMA, all coming together to really think about what were the resources they had, the questions they needed answered, and the ways that they could be collaborating to secure their assets. Through that research, they found that they were facing a three to seven foot sea level rise, a minimum of a three meter storm surge, which was going to be inundating. I don't wanna say catastrophic because that may be too far, but it was an impact which would require action on behalf of the base, on behalf of the city, and on behalf of the state itself as it was thinking about its own trunk lines. And from there, action was able to be taken. They've worked on shoreline restoration. That has included living shoreline restoration, which is now an enabled restoration initiative that Army Corps allows in a standard approach to addressing shoreline risk. They worked on dune rehabilitation, rehabilitation. They worked on hardening waterways as well. It's not always just green infrastructure. You have to bring gray in. There they brought in floodgates and flood walls. And they worked on improved communication tools, tools that were useful for the residents and for the base. And so when you think about these takeaways, we know that climate change is going to impact across the board. We see our cities often as the front lines where impacts are taking place. They are the homes to where our bases are located. And together, these partnerships can be really powerful 
to bring home not just a lot of conversation about what are the risks and what's it going to cost and how will we measure it, but they're putting work in the ground and they're actually changing the landscape for what does resilience look like in communities today. And so I really recommend this approach. When we think about climate change adaptation, everyone is going to adapt. That is going to happen. Humans are adaptive people. We're adaptive creatures out there on the earth. But if we're going to adapt in ways that really preserve our life, our liberty, our way of wanting to live and to be with one another, it's going to require thoughtfulness about what we do today and what we do into the future. And coming together through collaborations helps us to really open up those conversations and ensure we have access to the technology and the resources that we all need to get the work done. So thanks, Dan, for letting me be here to share a little bit about what ASAP is doing and join the panel for how adaptation is part of our solutions. Absolutely, Beth. Um, uh, I'm thanking you. Um, I'll, I'll send it right back at you and double it. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Um, we will now hear from Zalika Strong. Zalika is the Vice President of Government Affairs at the National Hydropower Association. Zalika, take it away. Thanks, Dan, and, and thanks everybody else for this really great, insightful information. And um, you know, clearly, climate change is so important to all of us. We're seeing so much uh, synergy right now, congressionally, as we're looking for true national uh, solutions. And um, I'm excited to kind of dovetail our conversation today with the role of hydropower that has been part of the climate change uh, conversation for decades. Um, you know, when we think about renewable generation, how important it is to integrate it in the mix, not only for a solution for a clean generation, but with hydropower, we really have the opportunity to have um, to enhance grid resiliency and reliability with integrating. Um, a lot of hydro into the grid, as well as also working together across other renewable resources like solar and wind power to, um, to uh, not only provide the clean energy solutions that we need, but also to pr provide the, the solutions to variability and intermittency issues. So I think with, with hydropower, we have been, like I said, we've been part of the conversation for a long time. Up until last year, we were about 9% of all renewable generation, all generation in the country came from hydropower, went down to 7% with wind kind of accelerating their investments in, in renewable energy. So um, still a very significant portion of what is clean and generated in this country. Um, in the last year, um, kind of moving forward, we have started to really look from an industry perspective on how we can better provide um, a, a strong role for hydropower as well as uh, pump storage to, to accelerate its positioning in the clean energy mix. And so together with a broad group of folks, we have moved forward to um, in what we consider the uncommon dialogue. Back last in uh, last October in 2020, the groups, or after about a year and a half conversation and, and um, negotiations, came together to work for towards climate change solutions as well as river conservation as in enhancing at the same time enhancing hydropower um, and pump storage uh, benefits for um, to advance clean energy. Um, this group is a, a group of industry folks and conservation folks um, that have in the past probably not sat at the table and this this historic and monumental opportunity has brought them forward to uh, provide some of these solutions and in this in this dialogue we've really started to look at what are the, some of the key pillars and infrastructure that are needed to be that we need investments in to um, address some climate address the climate change issues while also accelerating the rehabilitation, retrofit, and removal of the nation's more than 90,000 dams. Um, folks don't realize we've got about 90,000 dams in this country and 2,500 um, currently generate electricity. So um, clearly, you know, the, the makeup of the hydro industry is, you know, of these dams, uh, they facilitate a number of different roles from irrigation to, to also providing uh, generation issues. So generation solutions. So going back to what this uncommon dialogue has come together work towards is you know the four key pillars have been um, providing uh, how do we improve dam safety um, how do we leverage the federal tax code to incentivize some of these investments in hydropower to um, and within that framework of this itc uh, uh, is um, improving dam safety providing the needed investments for environmental improvements grid flexibility and availability um, it needs as well as um, incentivizing 
optimization for removing dams at the consent of the dam owner that no longer uh, provide uh, a, a resource to the community. Another key pillar um, that's really important for the hydropower industry, a lot of folks don't realize, um, the hydropower industry is a really interesting mix of uh, private, you know, dams that are um, with uh, independent IOUs, independent operating uh, utilities, um, as well as with, uh, you know, another half of our fleet is with the federal government, and a significant portion of our fleet um, is through public power customers. And so, you know, this dynamic and this very kind of um, resourceful industry over the decades um, has also needs not only investment on the private sector, but another important investment is ensuring that our federal fleet does have all of the necessary, um, uh, you know, O&M costs as well as uh, investments that it needs to continue to include renewable energy power generation as well as enhancing environmental performance, and again, improving a lot of these technologies that are needed to leverage the industry. Um, and then the third part, you know, the fourth part, which I think is a true showing of how important hydropower, the role of hydropower and clean energy solutions is, is really looking at from an infrastructure per perspective, is how do we look at the nation's dams and provide, you know, remove some of these dams that are high hazard, that are um, proved to be, uh, you know, basically not providing the energy that they, the energy resource they need, and also, um, uh, you know, have issues in which they, um, you know, there's a there's a desire to move them, and so we've worked together with these conservation folks to ensure that you know there's a stakeholder um, engagement with this process, and that the dam the removal of those dams um, is a, an effort that is um, that falls under the consent of the dam owner. So these four pillars have created a lot of synergy on the hill. We're looking at um, you know some congressional support to assure that we can really take the hydropower um, hydropower to elevate it as a, as a true clean renewable energy source and, and to elevate its role and to kind of continue um, providing the investments that, it, that the industry needs to, uh, to generate electricity. I think that the other part, you know, that I wanted to touch upon, um, you know, I think that one of the key, um, the industry has done a tremendous job in ensuring that you know um it's not you know having the right type of kind of renewable energy not only enhances grid resiliency and reliability but the industry itself has done is actively incorporating climate resilience strategies to mitigate vulnerabilities that um, to generation production so they're looking at you know the industry is invested in optimization of efficiency river management forecasting research on climate science so that we're able to power homes as well as be able to assess, you know, what the needs are in the community, deal with, you know, um, water like solar, like wind, um, as a, you know, as a natural resource, you're going to have a lot of transition. And uh, it's, uh, it's so we've done, the industry has done a lot to sh assure that um, factors such as participation, persist precipitation and timing of, uh, you know, snow melt, all of those, those regional fluctuations from year to year remain stable and that we're able to provide the energy resource that is needed. And so um, I think from a, you know, between the uh, historic investments from the hydropower industry, as well as this new kind of, this new effort through this uncommon dialogue to relook at the hydropower industry and address some of the uh, river and conservation needs um, and ensuring that we're part of the climate solution. Truly, tr truly shows the industry's perspective and investment in um, uh, addressing some of these climate change needs. Thanks, everyone, for you know allowing me to kind of give a perspective on the hydropower industry, and uh, excited to you know hear what some of the questions are from everyone. So thanks. Well, thanks to you, Zalika, and thanks to all of our panelists, um, uh, Joe, uh, Lisa, John. Um, Beth and Zuleika. Um You may notice that we are without one. Um, unfortunately, we lost him. Um, he had another commitment that we, um, um, so we lost him. But um, let me just for our audience, um, if Tim were here, he would continue talking about the benefits of performance contracting and the benefits of leverage and things like that. Um, and uh, there's one group that I just kind of very quickly wanted to call attention to is the Federal Performance Contracting Coalition. We actually featured them at a briefing back in March titled Energy Efficiency Means Business. Jennifer Schaefer was one of our panelists. So if you would like to learn more information about the issues that Tim covered, that's an additional EEI resource, ESI resource 
um, that addresses that topic. But now we have um, the better part of 20 minutes or so for Q&A, and we've got some questions lined up. Um, and uh, I think the first question I would like to um, dig into a little bit is we, we heard a lot about what the Department of Defense is doing um, and sort of, you know, whether it's the, the case study that Beth shared with us or it's the sort of the evolution of the last few years of how, you know, DOD has been sort of, um, you know, doing more and more on the resilience and the adaptation side. Um, I'd like to sort of look at it from the perspective of what other federal agencies might be able to learn from the Department of Defense. And Joe, I think we'll start with you, but um, I'll frame it a little bit different for you. Are there things that the Department of Defense has learned from other agencies? And then as we go through the rest of the panel, I'd love to hear about what the Department of Defense could do and sort of export to other um, entities around the federal government or even state and local government. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So um, one, I think we all agree the scale and scope of the of the challenge here before us requires a whole of government approach. And I, I have to agree with Beth that this isn't just limited to the to the federal government's approach. It, it also uh, touches on state and local. And uh, the fact is that bases are in communities, right? So we can't do what we need to do without support and collaboration with our state and local partners. Uh, on the federal level, I think it's important to think about the department's role and the importance of relying on the interagency uh, uh, relationships. So when we think about our allies and partner strategy, how are we going to talk about climate globally? What is our approach going to be with respect to our uh, global commitments to supporting uh, resilience at countries that may be challenged? How are we going to communicate that climate is a priority for us. We we have to partner with folks like the State Department and USAID. So the, the things that we uh, can work with them on and that we can learn from them and engaging our international partners and allies is really important. Um, are the, some of the challenges internally, I mean, the drought that impacts the Department of Defense also uh, and, and the, and the um, also affects the rest of the rest of the country, right? It affects uh, farmers and and it affects communities. And so, working with USDA and, D and Department of Interior on what a what's the right approach for us at a federal level? What is the right? What are some of the right solutions? How do we support not just the defense mission but everything else we have to accomplish? Um, and then to Tim's point and to into the one you just raised is that. Um, how, the, how do we collaborate with DOE to do things that are effective at addressing uh, the challenge? And uh, the, the ESPC, uh, the third party financed energy project is a great example, right? Um, we leverage uh, uh, FEMP's uh, contract uh, across the department to make sure that we are going to get uh, the kind of resilience improvements at our facilities that we need. John can speak to this probably uh, even better than I, and that is that, uh, and some of the folks on the, on, the, on the panel can as well, and that is that the, the Department of Defense is frequently challenged to get enough funding to make the improvements to our facilities that we need in the face of the climate challenge and, frankly, other challenges, uh, like a cyber threat to the grid. And we need to leverage the capabilities that exist in places like the Department of Energy and the expertise and, and frankly, the financing that exists in the private sector to make the kind of improvements we need. So this is a whole, not just a whole of government approach that we need to fix this problem, but it's a, it's a whole of country approach, federal, state, local, and private sector. Um, so I, I think there's a tremendous amount we can learn from, from each other uh, across, across both uh, federal agencies and across the public and private sectors. Thanks, Joe. Um, Lisa, let's go to you next. Um, what are some things that you see the Department of Defense doing that other agencies should, should, should learn from and um, implement to the extent that they can? Well, I mean, I think the rigorous planning and assessments that they do and the discipline with which they implement what they set out to accomplish is something that other agencies uh, will, will look to as best in class and then seek to adopt. But I think what underpins it is, you know, just as we heard the congressional um, history, brief history over the last decade or more about the recognition of the national security risks that climate change imposes, on our country um, and our economy. Um, when the Department of Defense makes something a priority publicly, the rest of the government, but I would argue the rest of the economy responds. And I recall you know, 10, 15 years ago when really climate risk assessment and then crime, climate risk management, both from an emissions reduction point of view as well as an adaptation and resilience point of view, took on a whole new level of import, importance across the Department of Defense, the private sector took note. Um, and then, you know, we're talking mostly about 
adaptation and resilience today as it relates to national security. But I would argue the investments and the economics underpinning the investments that the Department of Defense made in clean energy deployment were groundbreaking. And the private sector took note of it because given what we just described with, yes, you know, we support our military very strongly, but, but we still don't have enough resource to do all the things that we'd like to accomplish. And things like you know, third party financing can kick in and help, but still the scale is, is so significant. So people would ask, well, could we really afford to make those clean energy investments, even though we know that they are helping to um, address the emissions associated with climate change? There were still questions. But when the Department of Defense and its agencies put the data forward, showed that A, they could do it, that this was reliable, um, and this was affordable energy, and, that, and, and characterizing to the public what the benefits they were getting, you know, that was an eye-opener. And I think that was, you know, again, the start of the private sector taking another look at what they could do with clean energy, both for their climate and sustainability objectives, but also from their energy reliability and energy resilience perspectives. Thanks, Lisa. John, let's send it over to you. Uh, what are some things that you think the Department of Defense does well that other agencies should adopt? So <clears throat> I think it's important to recognize that uh, DOD doesn't have a monopoly on wisdom, but they just did, had a head start. Um, that they got to start on this issue earlier and were given a certain degree of freedom to do what they wanted to do um, over the last several years when other federal agencies were sort of steered away from climate change and, and as, a, as a focus area. And so they do have a head start and they have done a lot of things. I think I would boil it down to a, a couple main topics. One is mainstreaming. Climate change has been integrated into other functions in the Department of Defense in an important way. It's not set off in a silo. It's not some other, some assistant secretary off in the North 40 who, um, you know, isn't necessarily uh, that nobody's going to listen to or anything like that. It is integrated into a lot of other people's jobs. And Joe uh, wor is working this issue right up in the secretary's office. And let me tell you, everybody works for the secretary. And so therefore they have to pay attention to the issue. So I think that's one. Mainstreaming the issue is so very important and not sort of setting it off into a separate silo. I think the other piece that I'd, I'd just highlight at this point is, um, is guidance and setting the rules in place. DOD also has had a head start on this. Putting, it is hard to manage an organization with two or three million people. It's hard to manage any federal agency. And, and you just can't assume that somebody at a field office or at the base level knows what an assistant secretary or an undersecretary said yesterday. You have to write it all down. You can't assume anybody has a Twitter account or reads tweets from the commander in chief. You have to write it all down in formal, cumbersome bureaucratic documents, but it's the way you manage large organizations. And so DOD has put out a lot of that guidance over the last 10 years and in integrated climate change into those documents. Once again, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a characteristic of mainstreaming, uh, of making this part of everybody's job. And it's not the main part of everybody's job, but it's a part of everybody's job. And so you have to sort of think through you know, how it's going to affect you. And I'll give you one example from another federal agency. Um, I, I remember sitting in a, in a sort of a whole government meeting about climate change in the White House back during the Obama administration. I was the DOD rep, but I, re I remember as I was talking about how we were changing uh, the, the building codes for our construction and saying, okay, every dollar I get on construction from now on is gonna be climate, climate resilient construction because I'm just changing how I spend the money. I'm not asking for new money. Well, the DOT guy, the Department of Transportation uh, raised his hand and said, yeah, we spend billions and billions of dollars on infrastructure. And it's not that we need new billions for climate resilience. It's that we change the way we're spending the money we're already getting. And that that is making all every new project climate resilient. And I think that is the crux of this. Uh, the, the federal government, as we all know, spends a lot of money. And when you change how you spend the money you're already getting, that has a huge climate impact. So that would be my thought. That's great. And bonus points for mentioning building codes. That's a surefire way to get on the moderator's good side in the EESI panel. 
Um, Beth, let's turn it over to you. What are you seeing some things, uh, some things that you're seeing that other agencies could also do? Following John is great. I love all those things. Um, I think that the building code piece is so spot on. DOD has a head start knowing how to integrate future climate conditions into its risk portfolio. And that is information that every agency should have been thinking about and now is being required to think about. Um, I think that there's a opportunity for a lot of data sharing. We see some climate adaptation efforts collapse under the weight of having different sources of data that people are trying to reconcile. And it really exacerbates the distrust around the whole topic still of climate, which unfortunately still does exist in a lot of places. When you get local, it, it gets serious. DOT has an authority. I mean, having DOD out front and now having the private sector coming along to doing a lot more physical risk assessment. I think the SEC coming along, adopting some of the TCFD language expectations around integrating physical climate risk into disclosure is just continuing to shave down this kind of, what I call like the mountain of uncertainty that is going to get low enough that we no longer have to you know, get our like, gym shoes on to jump over it, we can just step over it in a regular meeting. Um, and so I think that DOD does that, just coming and ha having done this work. And then the last thing I would say is being willing to tell the story, which I, I don't think is probably a strong suit for DOD in general, but the IPP um, work in Hampton Roads wasn't easy. It collapsed at one point. They had to reform one of their working groups, um, but they worked through that and being willing to tell the story that, um, whole of government collaboration, especially when that whole of government means from, you know, the community to the Fed is hard. Um, I just think that people like to hear where challenges are so that we don't think it's going to always be, you know, we're going to get together and then the work is going to be smooth sailing. It won't be. And there's some really good reports out there that tell the story of where these collaborations got sticky and how they worked through it. So I hope those are stories that are going to get shared. Great, thanks. Zuleika, let's give you the last word on some things that other agencies could could, could do better following DOD's um, lead. Oh, you may be, I think you may be muted on your end, Zuleika. I'm sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, thank you for letting me know. I had it on mute. I'm on Massachusetts Avenue, so it gets loud out here. So um, I, I think a lot of what everyone said I, I would holistically agree with. I think what we need to consider, even just looking at the panel and just the number of touch points that are um, working towards uh, you know, climate change solutions. I think a lot of interagency coordination, data is key. Um, that's something our industry is working really closely with like the Bureau of Reclamation and Army Corps and those folks so that there's an understanding um, from a needs assessment um, and a decentralized effort to get that type of information to be able to share it. Um, I think one of, you know, in, in my past experiences, um, some some key things that I think have been really successful is that interagency conversation. The government is one of the, you know, uh, big, biggest procurers of um, energy equipment, whether it's from buildings to machinery to et cetera. And I think that um, there's a lot of an opportunity to be able to, to share some of those lessons learned. There's a lot of touch points in which communities are impacted by some of these rules and regulations. There's a lot of industries that have been bolstered by it, like ours. Um, so I think that that coordination and that um, availability of report, and I think, you know, on last point I wanted to lead off is there are a lot of different players now in the energy game. You know, back in 2003, when I went to FERC, it was this small agency at that time. But if you look at the number of folks that are now invested in working in this field and, and understanding, um, you know, and trying to find climate change solutions, um, having accessibility to that information where it's relatable across different platforms so from the technical to the more the policymaker the you know you know sorry this is my gr hat on but to that hill staffer that's working on energy for the first time and they couldn't tell you the scope of th different things so i think having you know, using that data to build those different types of platforms is really important. And, um, you know, I'm gonna give kudos to Lisa and PCSE and the work that they do um, with the Sustainable Energy Factbook has been something that I've, you know, a lot of folks use to get an understanding of some of those intricacies in that technical data, but also be able to elevate it to a position where you're talking to a broad audience as well. So, I, you know, so I think working across all of that and these agencies kind of working together um, to build to build that report would be great. Thanks, Alika. 
Um, we have about five or so minutes left. And um, Joe, I'm going to um, start with you for this next question. I know it's something that's a major priority of the of the administration, and that is, you know, doing what we're trying to do with when it comes to climate um, while keeping environmental justice and equity in mind. Um, but I'd like to give the opportunity for everyone to also, you know, offer comments if you have additional thoughts. But Joe, why don't we start with you? How can we ensure um, that the work that's being done around sort of the nexus of climate and national security is, um, um, it's real, the, those benefits are realized on an equitable basis? Yeah, thanks for that. It is a priority for this administration and rightly. Um, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that um, the impacts of climate fall will fall, do fall disproportionately on people who can less, uh, who can least uh, cope with some of the aftermath of climate events and changes that we see in our environment. So uh, the folks who lack air conditioning suffer the most when there's a heat wave. The folks that lack, um, who live in floodplains suffer the most when there's, uh, when there's, when there's a, a sea level rise, right? The folks that can't afford to rebuild or don't have insurance and know where to go, those are the folks who are challenged. And that's true in the United States. It's also true globally in that it's the kind of things displaced people uh, that, um, that suffer the brunt of climate and then also can pose a challenge for national security reasons. So you can't disconnect what we, what we need to do uh, uh, for climate reasons, uh, for national security reasons, from what we need to do to do the right thing uh, globally. And, and I just wanted to make a, a quick point on something Beth said about the Hampton Roads area is a, is a great example of why you need to work with communities. Um, the defense installation that, you know, uh, uh, Norfolk Naval Base is, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a big important base for the United States. Uh, it so happens that most of the roads that lead there are underpasses, um, and those are the underpasses. Those are the roads that get that get flooded. And if we can't get our people to work, or if people can't get to work, when you talk about equity, um, then none of us can do our jobs, and that's not good for the Department of Defense. It's not good for the community. It's not good for those folks who live and work there. So we can't disconnect what we need to do for national security reasons from what we need to do uh, to do what's right by by our people and by people globally. Um, across the panel, um, other thoughts about how we can ensure that these benefits are realized on an equitable basis? Um, we can go in the order. Maybe we'll go with Lisa, but um, if anyone has any additional thoughts, please feel free to speak up. Sure. I'll be brief. I'll just um, call out the Justice 40 interim guidance that was released a week and a half ago by OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, our national security I mean, National Climate Advisor, uh, Gina McCarthy, and the Chair of our Council on Environmental Quality, Chair Mallory. Um, that sets out, really, uh, what I see, number one, is a holistic uh, planning process for government agencies and on a very quick timeline. So um, without getting into a lot of the details, you know, one of the elements is a broad stakeholder engagement process, kind of rigorous assessment by agency and by program. And, and by doing that with a lens of equity and underserved and underinvested communities, specifically, they're gonna uncover data that they wouldn't have gotten before. And I think that kind of bottom up and top down together planning process will be very informative and hopefully will help people at the end of the day and communities. Thanks. Yeah. John, I think you raised your hand. <clears throat> yeah, so, so I, I just wanna make the point that equity and climate justice are, are in our self-interest, okay? It's in, in two or three different ways. One, the most uh, fragile nations and, and most uh, likely to be destabilized nations around the world are, are also the ones that are probably the ones most deserving of, are most of focus from a climate justice perspective. So if, if we make investments there to keep them stable and to, to give them resilience, it's going to have uh, impacts for our national security positive impact down the line. And I guess on a local level, a lot of the communities around DOD bases are lower income. And so by investing in defense communities, you are uh, contributing to uh, you know, environmental justice, but you're also protecting that base because those bases rely on their local communities for power, water, wastewater, employees, housing, so on and so forth. And so if the base, if the base is resilient, but the community is not, the base is still screwed. And so you still, you really, it's a, it's a all in the interest of the Department of Defense to, uh, to incorporate these things into the uh, climate, uh, into the justice strategy. All right, and I just have a um, we, we have to wrap it there because um, we have Senators Reed and Crapo coming up uh, in just a few moments. But um, let me just thank everyone, uh, Joe, 
Lisa, Tim, um, who had to leave us about three o'clock or so, Don, Beth, and Zalaika. Thank you so much for um, sharing your knowledge and your expertise and your experience uh, with our audience today. This was a really, really engaging panel. I learned a lot and um, I really appreciate the time that all of you took today to join us and um, to join our audience. So thank you so much. Um, really, really appreciate it. Hope everyone has a great rest of your Monday. Yeah, thanks everybody. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, thank you, Dan. Thanks, Don. <clears throat> thank you. Um, so we, so I, um, um, mentioned that we have uh, the next or the, the next agenda on our program is just about to start. Um, and um, I'm very excited about this. We are going to be joined um, in just a moment um, by our two Senate co-chairs, Senator Jack Reed and Senator Mike Crapo, and I'll introduce them in just a moment. But um, before I do that, um, I just wanted to uh, make a quick note to um, remind everyone that if you liked what you just heard, if you want to learn more about sort of any number of the topics, um, we cover a lot of stuff at EESI, and the best way to keep up to date with everything is to sign up for our newsletter. So if you have a moment, you can visit www.eesi.org, um, and you can um, sign up for our newsletter. Um, you can also learn more about climate adaptation, uh, more about environmental justice, um, pretty much anything that has to come, uh, or pretty much anything that comes across a congressional staff person's desk, you can learn all about it. Um, so it's now my privilege to introduce um, our two Senate co-chairs. Uh, Senator Jack Reed uh, and Senator Mike Crapo um, are, are great leaders when it comes to these issues. And they, um, you know, while ESI sort of executes the expo, it's, it's really a, a, an event that's sponsored by the House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucuses. Uh, senator Reed is the senator, senior senator from Rhode Island. He's a distinguished veteran. And he also is the chairman of the Armed Services Committee. And Senator Mike Crapo represents Idaho in the United States Senate. He is a ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee. Um, and he, as you will hear, uh, I predict, uh, a great champion of our national lab. So with that, um, let's turn over to a conversation with Senator Jack Reed and Senator Mike Crapo. Thank you. Well, Senator Reed, Senator Crapo, thank you so much for joining us today, uh, the uh, 2021 Congressional Clean Energy Expo and Policy Forum. It's great to see both of you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Good to be with um, you. Great. Thank you. Um, Senator Reed, I think maybe we'll start with you, the conversation. Um, why did you decide to chair the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus? And what is it about um, renewable energy and energy efficiency that makes you so enthusiastic about that? Well, it's, it's the key to our economy. It's the key to our environment. It's the key to the future of our country, really. Uh, when you look at the recent climate effects that have been ravaging the country, uh, you know that uh, investing in uh, renewable energy, energy efficiency is one of the major solutions. Uh, if we can use less energy and we can derive that energy from renewable sources, we won't have the climate effects. We also can become an economic leader throughout the world in terms of the technology uh, and uh, all of these things together will make our quality of life much better. That reason and also the ability to share with uh, Mike Crapo with the convincing things. Well, let me jump in on that. Uh, first of all, I completely agree with everything that Jack said. Uh, I really enjoy working with him. We are uh, a Republican and a Democrat who work very well together, and this is just one of those examples. Let me give a little bit even more uh, specific response with regard to my reasons, and I'm gonna kind of tie this to Idaho, being a little parochial. Um, many people don't realize this, but Idaho is a leader of clean energy development and the home to lead one of the, well, I think the leading nuclear energy lab in the United States, the Idaho National Laboratory. And roughly 80% of Idaho's electricity comes from clean energy sources. 60% of that is from hydropower, and 20% um, of that is from renewables. Um, and if you, I'll probably mention nuclear a couple more times during this discussion because nuclear is a very big thing to me. Um, at the Idaho National Laboratory, we're looking at a couple of really exciting, promising new advanced nuclear projects like OCLO's um, Aurora Micro Reactor and New Scale's modular, it's small modular reactor. Um, and we're working to get these reactors to deployment. 
So it's really a great opportunity for me, both from an Idaho perspective, perspective as well as uh, the broader economic and global perspective that Jack referenced. Great, thank you. Um, Senators, as I'm sure you know, many families spend a significant share of their monthly income paying their utility bills. Uh, some, in some cases, 10% or more, and that compares to a national average of about 3%. And energy burdens are often highest in rural communities, communities of color, and in tribal communities. How could U.S. energy policy better address equitable access to affordable clean energy? Senator Reid? Well, uh, one of the major programs that I've supported and I, uh, has been the weatherization uh, assistance program. This provides low-income families with the resources to go in and insulate their homes, uh, to change their heating systems. So essentially, they become much more efficient. The cost of energy goes down. And that's absolutely critical. And also the environmental aspects are significant because you cut down on pollution basically when you modernize these systems. And the other program that we have is the uh, LIHE program, the Low Income Heating Assistance Program, which actually helps pay for the bills of some of these people as you described who are in a very difficult position. Uh, I think frankly, uh, you know, in a more robust effort in terms of infrastructure, uh, affordable housing. Uh, when we do that, we have to make sure we build these affordable houses to be energy efficient. We've seen some examples in Rhode Island where they've been uh, actually three-dimensional houses, small homes, but extremely efficient in terms of energy use. And if we keep doing that, then we're gonna, we're gonna help these people who, who really need help. And I'll just add that uh, <clears throat> in addition to the weatherization assistance that Jack referenced and the housing improvements that Jack referenced and the other items, uh, both of us worked together last Congress uh, to pass the Energy Act of 2020, last December. And that act not only reauthorized programs like the weatherization assistance program that Jack referenced, but also uh, things like the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, uh, relating to energy and programs to facilitate the transfer of technologies to the private sector. And I think we may come back to this, but doing that is one of the ways we can reduce costs and we need to do it very effectively. And the, the last thing I'll mention is that clean energy R&D for technologies like storage and carbon capture and advanced nuclear, as I mentioned, are the kinds of things that as we move from the research and development to the deployment of these technologies will simply reduce the cost to those who face not only the pressure from the costs but also the need for access to these new technologies. Uh, thanks for that. Um, the, one of our panels today deals specifically with workforce development and jobs and renewable energy and energy efficiency jobs have been on a strong upward trend over the past several years, apart, of course, from uh, pandemic-caused losses. What are your priorities, Senator Reid and then Senator Crapo, to strengthen clean energy workforce development in Rhode Island and across the country? Well, in Rhode Island, we had 16,000 people, and we're a small state, about a million population overall engaged in this type of effort. Uh, the pandemic cut back, obviously, because of the slowdown in activity. But one of the things we have to do is make training available uh, for the skills that are necessary for uh, renewable construction, maintenance. As you know, we have the first offshore wind farm in the country off of Block Island, Rhode Island. And uh, there we're trying to develop the, uh, the workforce to not only build additional wind projects, uh, but also to service them on a continuous basis. So those are some things that we, we have to do. And I'm very pleased that in the last COVID-19 bill we passed last fall, late last fall we uh, committed about $35 billion for uh, wind, solar, and other clean power sources. So demand will, will, will drive up employment because they will need these skilled workers. And Senator Crapo, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was going to say the clean energy workforce in Idaho is growing at a surprising rate. Yes, it is. And, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, ag again, Jack has nailed it. Uh, we've got to ensure that our energy sector continues to be a robust job provider. And 
we've got to continue to invest in our workers so that they have the skills, as Jack said, to succeed in these highly technical jobs. Just to give an Idaho example here, even before the pandemic, the demand for qualified, educated workforce of skilled technicians was increasing rapidly. Uh, and to use the Idaho National Laboratory and nuclear again as an example, uh, about 40 to 50% of the nuclear workforce across America is eligible to retire in the next five years in both the private and public sector. And that will create an even greater demand and a necessity for increasingly skilled workers. And uh, I've introduced in that context a job, a, a bill with Senator Duckworth of Illinois in the last Congress, which we hope to reintroduce here soon, called the DOE Jobs Access Act, which does exactly what Jack was talking about in the nuclear arena. It establishes a five-year grant program run by the Department of Energy in consultation with the Department of Labor to facilitate the creation of apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship programs to help fill critical nuclear jobs. And grantee organizations would be required to cover at least 25% of the cost of these programs and each grant could not exceed $500,000. And in this program, then we're gonna also be serving veterans and young people and individuals who have barriers to employment who would receive priority in this grant awarding progress, a process. So all of these things to train our workforce uh, are necessary because if we succeed in expanding the investment and capital allocation to these new technologies, we've got to have trained workers to participate in deployment. Totally agree. Um, I, I won't be the one doing it, right? We'll need the, uh, the workforce uh, to actually get this stuff done, of course. Right. And our chances to um, halt climate change and avoid its worst impacts will be improved uh, if we harness the power of the public and the private sector. Um, and I think uh, here at ESI, we think that there's a role for federal leadership to initiate and encourage public-private partnerships. And I'm curious, in your opinions, uh, what are some opportunities for our government and businesses to work together? And uh, specifically, how could the federal government also help state and local governments forge new private sector partnerships? Uh, let me defer to Mike, because I don't want to be the first guy who always sees for co-equals. Co All right, I'll step in first this time, Jack. You know, as, as the ranking member of the Senate Finance Committee, I, I completely understand the role that the federal government and private investment plays in deploying these new energy technologies. Uh, I've, because of that, there's a couple of bills I'd like to reference that I'm working on that I think are kind of exciting. Uh, one involves clean energy tax incentives, uh, like I'm proposing with my bill called the Energy Sector Innovation Credit Act, which Senator Whitehouse and I have introduced. And this legislation provides up to a 40% investment tax credit or a 60% production tax credit across clean energy generation, carbon capture, and storage. And these tax credits are technology neutral. They're focused on clean energy though they specifically include clean hydrogen PTC. And uh, ultimately these technology or these tax credits will uh, basically phase out as the market penetration of these technologies become more mature. So it's, it's an effort to provide a support and an incentive from the federal government to the engagement of the private sector across these sectors. And, and one other area, just another quick example of fostering private sector and private public partnerships is, this isn't my bill, but it's the Financing Our Energy Future Act that I'm a co-sponsor of that expands the definition of what energy sources qualify under a master limited partnership business structure. Now that sounds kind of complicated and getting in the weeds, but a master limited partnership is a partnership that is taxed uh, like a partnership rather than, but its, but it's uh, interests its ownership interests are traded like a corporation, meaning that it's only taxed once at the shareholder level. And that gives it a significant access to larger and more liquid sources of capital. But it's limited right now to only be used for fossil fuel products, timber, and other minerals. And this legislation would, again, on a technology neutral basis, expand the definition to clean energy projects so that they can get this improved financing as well. Getting capital applied to these technologies is one of the most important things we can do. And it's the private sector, and that includes state and local governments. It's those sectors that can most, you know, take advantage 
of these opportunities to get the capital allocation where it should be. Well, I can't add that. I've done a superb job. I would emphasize the fact that tax credits are a very effective and efficient way to do this. Uh, it's used in many aspects of our economy. Uh, Low-income housing is one example. Uh, in addition, I think uh, engaging with private industry and universities and other research centers in research for the Department of Defense, DAPRA, uh, and trying to translate the experience we have uh, in the Department of Defense and many other agencies into the commercial sector is going to be another source, I think, of co cooperation and collaboration, which will be essential. Thank you. Um, based on your respective experiences uh, in Rhode Island and in Idaho, um, what renewable energy or energy efficiency technologies, and you've already mentioned a, a, between the two of you, a number of technologies that are very exciting. What are the technologies that you think hold the most promise to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, lower utility bills, create jobs, or better yet, accomplish all three goals? Senator Reed? Well, uh, first let me commend the, the local Rhode Island uh, Office of Energy Resources. They've done a superb job. In fact, we are consistently ranked in the top five energy efficient states in the country. Uh, and I'm very, very proud of the wind uh, energy offshore that we put in place. It was uh, the first time it broke the, the mole. It set off uh, expansion in other areas close by and uh, Martha's Vineyard around there. Uh, and that's one major contributing area. Uh, we've also looked at uh, trying to be more efficient with our resources. Uh, I've been, always been supportive of uh, increased mileage for our automobiles. And now we're moving into the electric phase of automobiles. And I hope that in the context of our infrastructure plans and proposals, we can create sort of a national system of charging stations. But Rhode Island, I expect to be in the forefront of that. So these are a few examples of what, what we want to do. Well, thank you. And in, in addition to the wind and solar and electrical and, um, for the vehicles that, that Jack has mentioned, let me be a, a little bit parochial again. As I said, I probably would be uh, and reference in Idaho, uh, nuclear is a big deal. And I'll come back to nuclear here. I really think that nuclear energy is one of the most significant new advances that we need to make. Not only because the United States has let itself get a little bit behind the curve in terms of other nations and their engagement, but because this is such a good source of high quality energy. Uh, that's one of the reasons I introduced a bill called the American Nuclear Infrastructure Act with a number of my colleagues, both Republican and Democrat. Uh, this bill would increase the efficiency and predictability of permitting processes for advanced nuclear. And I might add that that can be said about every one of these technologies. We've got to have a more efficient and predictable permitting process. Uh, further, we need to develop advanced nuclear fuels. Uh, those are becoming more difficult to get. And we can enable the preparation for advanced reactor demos at DOE sites like the Idaho National Laboratory. This enables us to increase collaboration with our U.S. allies and to strengthen our current aging nuclear fleet. And as I referenced, increase our energy security by reducing reliance on China and Russia for nuclear fuel. So um, like I said, I'm, I, I am really a big advocate for nuclear as one of the big solutions that we have that can be a very powerful, clean energy across the board. Thank you. Um, Senator Reed, Senator Crapo, both of you have been wonderfully generous with your time. I have one last question for you, and this one um, challenges us to look ahead and sort of define mm. what the leading edge of clean energy might, like, might look like. And we've talked a lot about many technologies, as I've said, and we already have many of the energy efficiency and renewable energy technologies we need to cut emissions and ensure we have the sustainable, affordable uh, energy that we need to continue to prosper. Um, Senator Crapo, you've mentioned Idaho National Labs. Senator Reed, you mentioned work going on in universities. There's a lot of very exciting research and development happening. When you look at the leading edge of clean energy, clean energy research and development, where do you see um, the opportunities that are especially promising? Well, I, it's just one area that I'll mention. It's the University of Rhode Island has just received an EPSCOR grant from the Department of Energy, another example of collaboration. And they are examining the, the possibility, feasibility 
of floating wind towers offshore. So you could move them out far away from the coast uh, to the objections of some of the people who live there, but also uh, do it in a way that you, you could, they're much more mobile, much more agile, you could move them around. Uh, and that's one of the things that break the mold technology that our university is looking at, and we have to keep it up. Well, and, and the answer to this question, in my opinion, is that we've got to deal with some, not only the broader things that we've talked about, the tax credits and incentives and other approaches that we've talked about today, but we have to identify specific supply chains and other issues in areas that are critical. For example, semiconductors. Uh, recently, the United States Senate passed a major piece of legislation that ended up getting nicknamed the China Bill because it had many different pieces of the, of the necessary steps that we need to take to become more competitive with China overall. But one of that, one of those pieces was the CHIPS Act that had put about 50 or $52 billion into helping us get stood up and much more competitive in the semiconductor industry with regard to China's efforts. 75% uh, of the global production in semiconductors is now occurring in East Asia, and we need to change that. Um, so on top of that, there's now another bill that Senator Wyden and I have put together in the Finance Committee called the FABS Act, which is the Facilitating American Built Semiconductors Act, which gives a 25% investment tax credit for investments in semiconductor manufacturing and construction of facilities. This is a focused tax credit rather than a technology nu neutral tax credit that will just help us get up to speed faster with regard to our global competitiveness in semiconductor supply chains. And then I'll just quickly go back and hit the bill I already referenced, the ESIC Act, which was a broad-based technology neutral act, which provides about a 35%, you know, I will just say, right now, according to the International Energy Agency, <clears throat> around 35% of the cumulative CO2 emissions reductions needed to move us to a sustainable path, uh, come from technologies that are currently at the prototype or demonstration phase. That's why I released a discussion draft of the Energy Sector uh, Investment Credit Act. And uh, that act was intended, again, on a technology neutral basis uh, to encourage investment in these new technologies. I think those are the exciting things. We need to incentivize the allocation of capital and the investment in these new developing technologies. That's what's going to be the exciting thing about helping us meet our targets. Thank you very much. Um, you Both of you have been wonderfully generous today, like I said. I know it's an incredibly busy time uh, in and around the United States Senate. Um, Senator Reed, Senator Crapo, thank you so much for joining us. And thank you again thank for you. your leadership um, at the top of the Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus. And as a former staff person, uh, I used to work for Senator Jeffords. Um, I know that they can be modest sometimes, but let me also just take a moment to thank your staff for um, everything they've done to make thank the you Expo very much. today uh, a successful event. And I look forward to seeing you both in person, um, hopefully before too long. So thank you, you again, and I Thanks, wish man. you a great Thanks, rest Mike. of your afternoon. Bye now. Good to be with you. Thanks. Uh, well, many thanks to Senators Reed and Crapo for um, joining me in that conversation. Um, thanks as well um, for their leadership um, and um, hard work um, leading up to today's event. And this is probably also a good opportunity to just recognize that uh, in addition to their leadership, we here at ESI also benefit from tons of hard work on the part of their staff and as well as the staff uh, who work with Sen Representative Kind and Senator Collins and Senator Van Hollen. Um, it is now my privilege to take us into our second panel uh, of the afternoon, uh, where we will discuss climate change and economic development. Um, I will introduce the panelists as we go, but we have a special guest to put us on the home stretch, and that is caucus deputy co-chair, Senator Chris Van Hollen. So I will turn it over to Senator Van Hollen to um, make some introductory remarks. Hi, I'm Chris Van Hollen, and I'm proud to represent Maryland in the United States Senate. And I'm especially pleased to be joining all of you once again at the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for our annual Congressional Clean Energy Expo and Policy Forum. 
Much has changed over the past year, but one thing certainly has not. The urgent need to deploy renewable energy and energy efficiency solutions to address the accelerating harm caused by huge emissions of greenhouse gases. Every day brings fresh evidence of the reality that the costs of doing nothing about climate change are real and staggering. But rather than focus solely on the costs of inaction, we should also focus on the huge opportunities for action, opportunities to build a stronger economy and generate millions of new, homegrown, good paying jobs that put people to work addressing this urgent crisis. That's why when President Biden talks about his plan for a clean energy economy, he talks about creating millions of good paying jobs because that is also a reality. And no one knows that better than those of you participating in this forum. But our global competitors also know the economic stakes and the opportunities. Every day, China pours more and more money into clean energy in a push to corner various markets. It's part of both their Made in China 2025 plan and their most recent five-year plan approved just this past March. As they expand their capacity in China, they will also export it to the world, generating more jobs for China. One of the best ways for us to combat their efforts, sharpen our competitive edge, and generate jobs here at home is to invest in clean energy. This is an issue that simply cannot wait. And I'm pushing forward every day with my colleagues in urging Congress to take immediate action. In the Senate, I'm proud to have introduced my Hope for Homes legislation, which invests in training more Americans to install clean energy and energy efficiency solutions in people's homes and give homeowners more incentives to use them. It's a win-win-win. More Americans in good paying jobs, more homeowners saving money on their energy bills, and less polluting emissions that cause climate change. And after more than a decade of fighting to make it a reality, I'm also pleased that my proposal to establish a national clean energy accelerator is gaining momentum. The accelerator, which is like a national version of the state green banks we've seen, will be a magnet for additional private sector investment in clean energy and energy efficiency and generate hundreds of thousands of jobs in that sector. Senator Markey and I reintroduced our legislation to create the accelerator this year, and I was very pleased that President Biden included our proposal in the American Jobs Plan, and it is now part of the Senate Democratic proposal for the Reconciliation Bill. That and other measures in President Biden's American Jobs Plan are making their way through the Congress. Investments in clean energy present a huge opportunity for American workers and our country by creating good paying jobs, bolstering our global competitiveness, saving on energy bills, and protecting our planet from the ravages and harmful impact of choking amounts of greenhouse gas emissions. We cannot rest until we take real action on this issue, and I'm proud to partner with all of you in pursuit of that shared mission. Many thanks for all that you do to make that happen. Take care. Thanks again, Senator Van Hollen, for helping us welcome our panel today. Um, we have uh, six all-stars uh, joining us this afternoon to talk about climate change and the necessary clean energy workforce um, that we will need to get us to where we need to be. Um, I will introduce the panelists as we go. And first up is Abby Ross Hopper. She is president and CEO of the Solar Energies Industry Association. Abby, welcome to our panel today. Welcome to the expo. Dan, thank you so much. It's good to be here. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so thanks for having me. It's uh, m maybe someday this will be in person again, <laughs> but but not quite yet. Um, but I'm really honored to have a chance to chat with you. Um, I know this is this is about climate change and the environment and the economy and job creation. So I just want to talk a little bit about the solar industry, what our employment situation looks like, and then what sort of policies we need to help that grow. So. Let me tell you a little bit about the solar industry's workforce. The solar industry um, 
is here. I mean, it's, I guess that's the best way to say it. We, uh, even during COVID, even during a pandemic, uh, we had 231,000 people employed in the solar industry. We created $25 billion of economic activity um, in our country last year. We create family supporting stable jobs. They provide retirement benefits. They provide health benefits. Our unionization rate is about 10.3%, which is on par uh, with the rest of the economy. Um, so we think that th being in the solar industry is an incredibly uh, important uh, opportunity. And we think about it not just as jobs, but as careers, and not just as careers, but as wealth generating opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities. Um, but we have so much opportunity ahead of us. And I think that's a lot of what I'd love to focus on is really thinking about um, what can be. And as we think about the president's climate goals and we think about getting to uh, you know, carbon free by 2035, despite the incredible growth of the solar industry, we need to grow four times faster than we have to date. So if you think about four times faster, the installation rates that that will require and then the, the workforce that that will, that will generate. So we think if we can get to those goals, we'll be almost a million people employed in the solar industry in the next you know 10-ish years. And so we gotta think a lot about how we're gonna do that. So I wanna talk about infrastructure. Obviously, um, I feel like that's all we talk about in Washington right now is infrastructure and will it happen, how it will happen, what will happen. Um, I'll leave others to talk about that. What I know is that it will be really, we have this incredible, I know we all say it, once in a generation opportunity to build a clean energy economy that will create hundreds of thousands of solar jobs, will create opportunities for communities all across the country. And I'm deeply, deeply hoping that the Congress gets it together and passes something. Um, there are really important things that we need to keep the solar industry's growth on the right trajectory and growing four times faster than it's growing today. Um, one of the most important things is just some stability. You know, we've had four years in the prior administration of a lot of policy back and forth. Um, and in order for companies to employ huge amounts of capital and make those investment decisions, they need certainty. And that certainty often comes, at least for the solar industry, in the form of tax policy. Um, the investment tax credit has been the foundational policy for the solar industry. It's critical um, to our financing. It's important. To, um, to having these projects move forward. And so we have been asking Congress for a long-term, i.e. 10-year extension of that investment tax credit. That will provide the certainty that companies need in order to continue to deploy and continue to invest. Um, that one of the things we're also asking Congress is one of our priorities is the direct pay for that investment tax credit. I could talk a long time about what sort of some of the financing challenges have been, particularly in light of COVID, and the retraction of the, um, of the financing and the tax equity marketplace. But the short version is a lot of projects have been held up because there's not uh, as much of an appetite for tax equity and there's more competition for it. And so to provide a direct pay um, option on the investment tax credit would really unleash a whole bunch of solar projects. And so um, those are the two sort of most important things. Some of the other critical pieces, however, are things like the storage investment tax credit. That's a, that's a really important part of how this whole thing works all together. We talk a lot about transmission and making sure that we have the infrastructure to create, um, to create that. The second sort of group of priorities I would say is really around the workforce and making sure that we have the workforce ready and able to build out this, um, transit, this clean energy transition. And so there are some really good bills that have been introduced in Congress around workforce training ensuring that people from all sorts of communities and every community can participate in this burgeoning industry. And so we are incredibly supportive of those. And then last but certainly not least is really around domestic manufacturing. As we think about really holistically about what we want this clean energy transition to look like and how do we wanna take full advantage of the economic opportunities, it's really important to create a healthy and vibrant manufacturing sector. Uh, we have had some challenges with that here in the past. I don't think it's unique to solar, uh, but I do think we have done a lot of thinking about what that domestic manufacturing uh, might look like. We think that it's in order for the government to be helpful and Congress to be helpful, they need to do two things. One, they need to uh, look at that demand um, 
uh, sort of incentives, like I talked about, the investment tax credit, but we also think they need to provide support directly to manufacturers. And we have talked about um, a production tax credit so that there is not only so the uh, tax credit for the investing in your manufacturing facility, but also when you're producing product. Um, as, as again, as we see this opportunity to grow four times more quickly, having a uh, manufacturing base here in the United States, having supply here in the United States, having that technology stay here in the United States, I think will be incredibly important. And so Dan, I don't need to take all of my eight minutes. I'd rather have more conversation, but I will say, what an honor it is to uh, be with these other esteemed panelists. They're some of my closest friends in the clean energy transition. So thanks for inviting me today. Absolutely, Abby. Thank you for being off to a great start this afternoon. Um, really appreciate um, you taking the time and it's always great to see you. Uh, our mm -hmm. next panelist uh, we will hear from is Paula Glover. Paula is president of the Alliance to Save Energy. Welcome, Paula. It's great to see you too. Thanks, Dan. It's great to see everybody. And thank you so much for this introduction. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with the Alliance to Save Energy, we are a bipartisan nonprofit coalition of companies, NGOs, utilities, trade associations, um, and others whose primary focus is really advancing federal energy efficiency policy. So I've been in this role um, since January, um, and I really am grateful and appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And I'm especially grateful because I get to be um, on a panel, not with just some esteemed leaders in this industry, but also some of my favorite people. Um, I'm going to start really by saying, Abby, I, I couldn't agree with you more, right, that um, the potential for this clean energy economy um, is um, the opportunity to be incredibly productive, um, but that we are talking about careers. And so it's really important, I think, to say that first, um, that we're not talking about jobs, we're talking about careers and uh, careers that have opportunities for um, advancement. And so I'll, I'll just talk a little bit about um, what I think energy efficiency can do in this larger story. Um, you know, oftentimes we talk about energy efficiency or talk about the clean energy economy, energy efficiency kind of gets left out of that discussion. And so I'm really thankful that we get to participate so that we can say, and I can say, we should all be thinking about efficiency first. Um, efficiency, I believe, is the first fuel um, because if we can maintain our quality of life um, and do all the things that we need to do when we want to do them in the way that we want to do them and still use less energy, that is a huge win. Um, but oftentimes when you talk about energy efficiency and talk about people who work in energy efficiency, most people don't know who you're talking about. Um, if you ask someone who a clean energy worker is, they can tell you it's a solar installer. They may tell you that it's a wind turbine technician. Um, but the largest employer in the clean energy economy is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency, we employ more than 2 million Americans, um, meaning we're responsible for nearly 70% of all the clean energy jobs. It's also an essential sector, I believe, for combating ch climate change, right? If we're able to make our homes, our buildings, our industry, our vehicles more efficient, making them operate just as well while using less energy, we can alone reduce carbon emissions in the U.S. by 50% by 2050. So efficiency has a big role to play. And that's a big piece of this puzzle around decarbonization. Um, the jobs that exist around energy efficiency cover a wide variety of skill sets. We are talking about people who can be a construction worker who is installing insulation in your home, a manufacturer of Energy Star appliances, an energy auditor who's taking a look at your home and looking at ways to reduce energy waste. Um, and so the variety of employment and energy efficiency is really difficult for us to market because I can't point to one thing. But I would say it is also our biggest asset as an industry, right? The fact that people can do all sorts of things in the energy efficiency space um, and have a role in building our clean energy economy. Um, many of these jobs require maybe not a four-year degree, but high school diploma and additional training or certifications. Um, other jobs do require a four-year degree and beyond. We have master's degrees and PhDs who work in our space. And so there's a large span of opportunity and efficiency that I like to make sure people are aware of. Um, on top of that, our jobs are available in 99.8% of the counties in the United States. That means energy efficiency jobs are available everywhere. Um, it's only six counties in the U.S. that don't have energy efficiency jobs and 
would not be surprised to learn that probably those those particular counties may not have a lot of people, not a lot of housing, not a lot of building, et cetera. Um, so when you're looking at how we're going to address climate change and what are those economic opportunities available while we address climate change, and, and quite frankly, as we move to this just energy transition, I'm going to say and argue that energy efficiency plays a significant role in that. Um, and we have the ability to continue to grow this sector um, if we are able to reduce some of the barriers to entry that exist. Um, and that's all dependent on what the policies are and getting those policies right. So for example, last week you may have seen that the Department of Energy released a 2021 U.S. Energy Employment Report. And that provided some of the most extensive analysis to date of the pandemic's impact on energy employment. Unfortunately, it found that energy efficiency lost more jobs than any other sector in 2020. One reason being that many contractors were unable to get inside people's homes. We all know that during the pandemic, we were all locked in our own homes. We were not necessarily letting others come and join us there. Um, that's a huge turnaround from previous years. In fact, Last year's report found that efficiency added more new jobs in recent years than any other sector in this industry. So getting this sector back to the rate of growth um, is not just optional, it's mandatory if we are going to decarbon our, decarbonize our economy um, on the very rapid timeline, the necessary timeline that's been established. And it's gonna mean that we have to have targeted policy in place. Um, one example would be reforming tax credits. And so you heard just a few minutes ago, Abby talking about the importance of tax incentives for the solar industry. For the efficiency industry, tax credits are really important, but quite frankly, they're out of date. Um, and it's been a while since they've been written, rewritten. One analysis has found that just reforming, simple reforms of tax credits could create almost 600,000 jobs by driving demand for energy efficiency products and services. Um, in fact, this is a policy that was selected as one of the top 10 options for creating clean energy jobs by the Clean Project Independent Analysis um, out of hundreds of submissions. Um, another example of a policy that could create thousands of jobs and efficiency um, is launching a national campaign to retrofit our country's public buildings, um, which would mean that we would not only reinvest in our communities, create local jobs, but would also cut those energy bills and hopefully give a break to those um, communities' taxpayers. Um, another point that I want to emphasize, right, um, is that the goal should not just be to build back, but we need to build back better. Um, and an absolutely an essential part of that is making sure that clean energy economy and energy efficiency, more specifically, is available to everyone. Last week's jobs report found that while the efficiency workforce is slightly more diverse than the national workforce average, it's far from representative um, for women and African Americans. Um, and that's not an issue that's just going to solve itself, right? Even with companies' best of intentions, um, while they're reforming their internal processes and how they hire, the problem lies with the fact that some communities may not even be available, aware of these opportunities um, or may not even be able to access training. Um, we at the Alliance support Congressman Rush's Blue Collar to Green Collar Jobs Development Act because we believe that that would create training and apprenticeship programs for green jobs. And the fact that it does focus on underserved communities is what can help fill that gap and get us to a place where we have more people who are having the opportunity to participate and who want to participate in energy efficiency in this clean energy economy. What's happening today on Capitol Hill, it's exciting. Um, it's a little scary. I think that's what Abby was alluding to. And yes, we are always talking about infrastructure. Some of us are still talking about Facebook. Um, but we've got to remedy these issues around workforce. I mean, we need to make sure that our energy jobs um, are going to be accessible to all communities in the future, that they are inclusive. We know that they are well paying. We want to make sure that everybody can participate. Um, we think that this infrastructure package can be transformative, but we've got to get it right. And after we get that right, there's still so much more that we can do. Um, so I am looking forward to the conversation, Dan. I appreciate the invitation um, and everyone that audience. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Paula. That was, those are great remarks. I really uh, appreciate all of that. Um, it's so nice to see you. And at some point, like Abby said, we will be back in person, um, for sure. Um, if only yeah. because you lost for the last Please. panel of the day, there's that first glass of wine of the day. And I think we all sort of <laughs> merit that as well. Lots of heads nodding. Um, next up, we will hear from Jason Walsh. 
Jason is executive director of the Blue Green Alliance. Welcome to the panel today, Jason. Thank you, Dan. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here uh, with such a fabulous lineup of colleagues. Uh, as you noted, my name is Jason Walsh. I'm the executive director of the Blue Green Alliance, uh, a national partnership of labor unions and environmental organizations. Uh, it is our partner's firm belief in our coalition's guiding principle that Americans shouldn't have to choose between good jobs and a clean environment. We can and must have both. We are now in a unique moment to embody that principle in the policy choices we make. We can address the climate crisis and create good jobs and a more equitable society as we work to rebuild our economy and recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. Over the last decade and right now, we are witnessing, some of us are living through the worsening impacts climate change is having on our communities. As we've worked to drive down emissions to address the climate crisis, we've seen examples of how clean energy investments can spur economic growth and high quality job creation across the country. For example, a unionized crew of tradespeople built the Block Island Offshore Wind Project off the coast of Rhode Island. Union auto workers on factory floors across the country are building cleaner cars and trucks and workers in St. Louis and Los Angeles are gaining access to high-skilled jobs in energy efficiency retrofitting, pipe fitting, and transit manufacturing. These are good union jobs building and maintaining a clean energy and climate resilient economy today. At the same time, we're not moving nearly fast enough to make the necessary investments to meet our climate goals and not enough of the new jobs that have been created or promised in the clean energy economy are high quality family sustaining jobs. We can do better and we must do better. Unionization is a key pathway to quality jobs and family sustaining wages. Union jobs on the whole pay better, have better benefits and are safer than non-union jobs. Workers who are members of or represented by a union earn significantly more than those who are not across all relevant industries and occupations with especially pronounced benefits over lower paid workers, or workers of color and women. Female union members and black union members earn 28% more and Latino union members earn 40% more in wages than their non-union counterparts. Increasing union density in clean energy sectors is therefore a critical way to address the unacceptably high levels of income, income inequality in our country. We also have a range of complementary policy mechanisms for raising wages, building career pathways, and increasing access to good jobs. These include utilization of registered apprenticeship, pre-apprenticeship, and other union-affiliated training programs, as well as project labor and community benefit agreements, which are negotiated with both union and community partners and often include local hire provisions, targeted hire of low income or disadvantaged workers and the creation of pre-apprenticeship pathways for apprenticeship positions on projects and longer term careers in the building trades. As we work to meet our climate goals and make the necessary investments in energy efficiency and the deployment of renewable technology nationwide, attaching these tools to public investment in clean energy can help ensure that these investments translate into good and accessible jobs. At the same time to bring home the full benefits of the clean energy transition across the economy, policymakers must ensure that these investments also translate into domestic manufacturing to produce the products and materials that go into these projects. Manufacturing has a long history of supplying good jobs to workers across this country and has been the backbone of the American middle class. However, the nation has lost nearly 5 million manufacturing jobs since 1997. If the nation fails to make the investments needed and put in place smart policies, American manufacturing will continue to weaken. Countries around the world are rushing to capture the manufacturing and job benefits of the global shift to clean energy. And today, far too many of the solar panels, solar components, EV components, and parts and materials for wind turbines that build the clean economy are manufactured overseas and shipped to the United States. Unfortunately, decades of bad policy Offshoring and outsourcing have weakened supply chains and cost jobs, and the U.S. has not been taking full advantage of the opportunity to support and strengthen domestic manufacturing. Steps need to be taken now to rebuild these vital supply chains, grow jobs in our country, and position U.S. manufacturers to lead the world in the most global, most important global economic race of our time. 
This includes policies that both increase the demand for clean technology, including by America domestic content requirements for clean energy tax credits, as well as supply side incentives to support and grow American manufacturing and domestic supply chains. And let's be clear, we don't have to choose between achieving our climate goals by deploying clean, affordable energy and creating quality family sustaining jobs across our economy. We can have both at the same time. and We have analysis to back that up. Researchers from Princeton University in a recent working paper found increasing wages by 20% would have a minimal impact on the capital costs of solar and wind projects. Those small cost increases may very well be offset by an increase in labor productivity, which often results from better training and the job stability that comes with better wages and working conditions and responsible employers. The research also found the impact of increased domestic manufacturing for clean energy to be similarly minimal, uh, with a 10% increase in domestic sourcing associated with only a roughly 1% increase in costs for solar PV projects. When looking at the larger picture of the impact that increasing the wages of clean technology workers and domestic content utilization would have on the total cost of transitioning to a clean energy system. Again, the Princeton researchers found that the impact was very minimal, determining that there's only a 3% difference in supply side investment cost over the entire transition period from 2020 to 2050, and that these costs would have no recognizable impact on the scale and speed of clean energy deployment. On the flip side, workers in these industries would see significant benefits including billions in higher wages and hundreds of thousands of new jobs in the 2020s. I'd also argue that we'd see less quantifiable but no less important political economy benefits. The hard reality is that most union workers in manufacturing and construction don't currently see themselves in this clean energy future we're all working to create, particularly those who've been able to build middle-class lives in fossil fuel intensive sectors. Until, until they do see themselves in that future, they will not support it, and that comes down to jobs. In closing, we have an opportunity to make strategic investments in clean energy in ways that ensure the jobs created are good jobs and that the investments deliver gains for American manufacturing, for workers, and for communities, which in turn can build a political coalition of stakeholders that can endure over the coming years and decades, because we're going to need it. Thank you for giving me the time to talk. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Jason. Thanks for your remarks today. It's great to see you. Um, our next panelist is Heather Zeigel. Heather is CEO of the American Clean Power Association. Heather, it is also really nice to see you, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation today. Great. Thanks so much, Dan. It's a pleasure to join you. Um, you know, so much has been said by many of my colleagues that obviously is in line with the American Clean Power Association. So I'm going to just try and pull on a couple of threads and talk about some of the new data and opportunities that I see coming down the pike. Um, the American Clean Power Association is a relatively new trade association we launched in January of this year. And our directors um, kind of did that with a vision towards saying, listen, you know, clean power is no longer this, you know, down the road kind of energy source. It's something that's here today. We're a trillion dollar part of the economy. We employ 415,000 employees and we've invested $334 billion in the US economy since 2005. So let's figure out a way collectively to speak on behalf of wind, both on and offshore, solar storage and transmission. Um, so I'm very excited to be launching, uh, to, to be running this new trade association. But it's also really exciting because we do have this historic opportunity. And I feel like in Washington, we've been talking about what a great once in a generation opportunity we have before us. But it's really like if you stop and think about when was the last time the country had a chance to make this kind of significant investment in clean energy, whether that's, you know, as Abby talked about, getting the, the tax policy right. Um, as, as Paula talked about, making sure we're realizing the opportunity around energy efficiency, um, as Jason talked about, you know, really thinking about what does that domestic supply, uh, domestic contents and supply chain story look like, and how do we make sure we're doubling down to create as many good paying jobs as we can. The exciting thing for me about the climate agenda is that we've been able to kind of reconstitute it into a discussion that's no, not just about melting ice caps and GHG emissions. It's truly about how do we rebuild economies? How do we create those jobs of the future? 
And frankly, how do we make sure that we're not taking a back seat to countries like China or EU, et cetera? So um, I'm really excited uh, about this opportunity and, and the scale is so unprecedented, right? I mean, we've done some analysis that shows if you were to reach um, a majority renewables grid by 2030, it's gonna require nearly a trillion dollars in capital investments in renewable po po power projects uh, storage systems and the, the vital transmission needed to ship the power around the country and, and bolster both resilience and reliability. Um, I think, you know, we're, we're obviously, this is kind of a make or break week around the um, bipartisan infrastructure framework. And as I told President Biden last week in a White House meeting with CEOs and labor leaders, ACP is really proud to support the BIF, as we all affectionately call it. Um, we also really are supporting important provisions that are included in the Senate Clean Energy for America and House uh, Green Act, representing a significant investment to advance clean energy deployment and combat climate change. And I mean, I don't, I could just, I could re, I could like use Abby's words again, because whether it's direct pay or, you know, the important uh, storage opportunity, what we have to get done on, on transmission, the workforce training, uh, domestic content, um, all of those components are obviously, you know, at, at the lifeblood of, of ACP. But what's exciting to me is that, you know, we're, it's not just about the American Clean Power Association. It's about the collective voices here in this conversation, all being on the same page, pulling in the same direction. And, um, you know, I, I think that only makes our opportunity for success that much greater. Um, you know, the I was specifically asked to talk a little bit about the workforce issues, and and I think it's as Jason said, it's it's really um, the the fact that this transition is going to be a powerful economic growth engine. Um, you know, we have looked at this eight thousand different ways, and um, you know the the pathway to a twenty first century economy powered by twenty first century clean energy has the opportunity to create five to 600,000 new jobs by 2030, making, um, you know, a creating a tremendous opportunity for a unionized workforce. Um, you know, I, I look at it and I see the manufacturing, professional service and construction sectors seeing the majority of employment growth with manufacturing counting for 38% job growth, professional services representing 25% and construction at 21%. Um, everybody, if you if you work in the clean energy space, you have memorized the talking points that uh, wind turbine technicians and so solar photovoltaic installers um, are, you know, high demand jobs that are, you know, producing and installing the renewable energy and in, 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 in new capacity that's going to be required. Uh, these jobs will be spread across all 50 states and in red states as well as blue states, offering many American workers above average wages. Um, you know, these these are good jobs, um, you, know, uh, you know, lots of in-demand um, occupations. And, uh, you know, as, as, as we have this conversation, I think union labor is an important component of clean energy development as unions are pivotal to preparing the high-skilled labor workforce needed to deploy both renewable and battery storage capacity across the nation. Um, you know, I, I think kind of just to, to wrap things up, um, I, we will, as a trade association, I'm excited that later this week, we're going to um, announce our first ever clean power annual, which is a detailed look at everything, um, clean energy jobs, investment and environmental benefits to key market data. Um, and if I had a couple of takeaways, the first is that renewables rebuild our economy uh, beyond creating the jobs in all 50 states. Um, you know, the, the, we just in 2020 alone, uh, were roughly 30, $39 billion in project investments. Um, and clean energy is driving nearly unmatched investments into rural communities, which I think is really exciting. Last year alone, the clean power industry paid an estimated $1.7 billion in state and local taxes and nearly $800 million in land lease payments to landowners across the United States. And then the second is just that clean energy is red, white, and blue. 84% of congressional districts are home to clean energy projects, manufacturing facilities, or both. 
And there are direct clean energy jobs in all 50 states, traditionally red and blue states and some purple ones all top the clean energy leaderboard in 2020. Texas added the most clean power capacity last year with 6,300 megawatts, followed by California, Florida, Iowa, importantly, my home state, and uh, Oklahoma. So I think this story, um, you know, outside the beltway about what we're doing to create new jobs and um, new economic opportunities is a, is a good one. And one that, you know, obviously is important to, to tell during this pivotal time, but um, is, is also one that I'm hopeful we will be able to fi find some important bipartisan opportunities to advance um, both the clean energy and uh, uh, climate um, initiatives forward. Thank you. Thanks to you, Heather, for those remarks. That was great. Um, I am very pleased to welcome our next panelist to the panel, Genevieve Cullen. Uh, Genevieve is the president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. Genevieve, take it away. Thank you so much, uh, Dan. I really appreciate the opportunity to be back here with you today. Um, I've been a participant in this expo um, in many different capacities, and it's always the best sort of one-stop shop for clean energy policy that you could ever get. So thanks for, for you know, pushing forward and making it happen um, in these strange days. Um, and to everyone out there, good afternoon. Glad to be here. I'm Genevieve Cullen, president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. We are the cross industry association representing the entire value chain of electric transportation. My members are vehicle and component manufacturers, electric utilities and infrastructure providers. And collectively, we are building the entire EV ecosystem. To start this conversation today, I just wanted to take a moment and just in case everyone doesn't spend as much time thinking about this, uh, as, as I do to just sort of locate the technology and the industry where it is and what that means for where we can go. Um, so first, um, there have been many reports and they increase in number and urgency that remind us that we cannot get to our national greenhouse gas emissions goals to net zero without scaling electrification in the transportation sector. Um, we need to do it and we need to do it rapidly. Um, second, as has been wisely noted uh, by previous speakers, this is where the global market is going. And so this is an opportunity and a choice for the United States to decide whether we are going to lead this market that we help to build or just follow and buy what they sell us. Um, and finally, and not, re you know, not remotely, the least consequentially, electrifying transportation has unique, enormous human benefits. And that includes better air quality, lower energy costs, transportation costs for consumers and more livable communities for everyone. So it's, these are um, substantial benefits, but to do that, we need to scale up. Um, so let me just give you a sense of, of, of where we stand today. Um, right now, there are just a smitch under 2 million uh, plug-in vehicles have been sold and 8,000 fuel cell electric vehicles. Um, there are roughly 60 models of plug-in cars on the market today. That's up from two that were available in 2010. Um, and that number, that 60 number is going to more than double over the next five years. At the same time, charging infrastructure is expanding rapidly. And today there are close to 50,000 public charging stations across the United States and Canada that represent approximately 120 uh, charging ports. Uh, this is critically important to the growth of the market. Um, I, you may or may not be aware that um, you know, we have we built out a timeline of, of vehicle manufacturers and, and of their announcements and there's one pretty much every day uh, about uh, major OEMs and newcomers talking about electric fleets and um, making commitments to um, partially or completely electrify their products in the 20 to 30 to 2040 time frame all of that is sort of um, one of the indicators that underlies uh, the uh, projections 
notably from Bloomberg New Energy Finance that says global sales of plug-in vehicles will outpace internal combustion engine sales by 2040. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a big growth pattern for the industry. And I guess the question here, Jay, is what does that, what does that mean for employment and, and jobs and the benefits that that can bring? Um, the, um, the previously referenced DOE Energy Employment Survey um, reported uh, last year that alternative fuels and hybrid manufacturing employed approximately 273,000 workers, a net increase of, of 7,300 jobs. Even in, in um, 2020, as you might have um, noticed, was, was a rough year in the car industry, and still that segment added, added jobs. In fact, the EV sector grew by six, about 6,000 jobs, or 7%, um, and the hybrid sector also grew uh, 6,000 or so jobs at, at a rate of 5.5%. And um, because we are so a little bit new and extremely diffuse in our employment opportunities, that report doesn't specifically capture um, EV infrastructure deployment, but I think two important indicators in that report show uh, more than 66,000 jobs in battery energy storage and 69,000 in various forms of grid modernization, um, which, uh, which are all related to um, the EV ecosystem. In fact, I think everybody, everybody on this panel is, is part of the EV ecosystem. Um, so as we, you know, as we scale the market, we will scale employment. And there are multiple analyses that, that show different numbers and, and rates. And, um, you know, you can go blind reading them and, and their methodologies. But what they all share in common is a, is a sense of this enormous, I will repeat the term, opportunity to, to really um, to, scale, um, to scale the opportunities across this ecosystem. Um, so I'm going to just highlight, for instance, the advanced energy economy recently re modeled what uh, the administration's $274 billion um, EV transition investment would look like. Um, what would that mean for jobs? And uh, they estimate that that would result, would create 10.7 million jobs. That's measured in job years. Um, specifically, um, purchase incentives create 6 million jobs. EV manufacturing and supply chain investment produce 2.6 million jobs. Charging infrastructure investments create 1.2 million. Workforce training generates over 100,000 job years. So this is just a small slice of the potential benefits that come from, um, as everyone is fit, happily saying, go big, um, because this is the time to um, do it now, do it right, and make it fair. And I think um, there's this opportunity to get all of the benefits that we need. Obviously, um, policy is going to be a, the major driver. Um, and as, as uh, previous speakers have identified, yes, purchase incentives for electric drive vehicles are critically incentive, not just, um, not just cars, but also trucks and buses. Um, we need to up, increase uptake across every vehicle segment and across price points. Uh, we need a, a comprehensive investment in infrastructure that not only serves a interstate communities, but uh, multi-unit dwellings, urban and rural communities. Uh, we need to directly invest in U.S. manufacturing, as again has been noticed. Uh, we need uh, resilient and increasingly domestic supply chains. And finally, we have to keep investing in R&D and D because we have to stay at the front of this game, keep leading in technology, making it perform better and cost less. Um, so that's, that's a fairly large menu of, of items and I'm happy to answer any questions you have about them. And thanks again for letting me say my piece. <laughs> Absolutely, Genevieve. And um, as moderator, one of the things I get to do is I get to give out brownie points. And one of the things I give brownie points out for is by when panelists give me an opportunity to plug previous EESI briefings. And so you gave me two opportunities. One is we actually covered the Sustainable Energy in America Factbook back um, 
uh, on March 12th. That's uh, with Bloomberg uh, NEF and the Business Council for Sustainable Energy. And Lisa Jacobson with Business Council is actually on our earlier panel today. And so if anyone in our audience wants to dig into the SACE <clears throat> Factbook a little bit more, that would be a great resource. And then more recently on June 4th, uh, we actually had a Bloomberg NEF speaker. Uh, we had Daisy Robinson join us to talk about um, biodiesel and sustainable liquid fuel as well. And, and so a third brownie point, because that last point brings us to liquid fuels. And so it's my pleasure to introduce our sixth panelist of the panel, Chris Bliley. Chris is Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs for Growth Energy. Chris, welcome to the panel. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, great to bat clean up on such an esteemed panel. Uh, certainly appreciated the comments of everybody before me. And I, I, I'll actually touch on a lot of the things that, that, that were just said. Um, we are going to need more, not less, clean energy solutions. if We want to truly meet the climate goals of this administration and others. Uh, there was a, an analysis done today by our own Department of Energy that said 90% of greenhouse gas emissions from transportation today are from petroleum. So anything on the alternative fuel side to reduce our dependence on oil and, and frankly, foreign imported oil is a positive. Uh, for those who don't know growth energy, we represent our ethanol industry. So 200 biorefineries across the U.S., to produce roughly 10% of our nation's liquid fuel supply and are poised to do much, much more. Every gallon of ethanol reduces uh, greenhouse gas emissions on average 46% compared to gasoline. And with off the shelf technologies, including many uh, mentioned earlier by some of my energy friends on the solar and wind side, we actually have the ability to get to a 71 to 75% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. Um, as noted, you know, we are, and I think Genevieve did a great job of talking about scaling up of electric electrification, but we are going to have liquid fuels in our transportation system for decades to come. And it's imperative that we do everything we can on the fuel side to get those greenhouse gas emissions benefits, as well as other toxic benefits. Today, we account for 300,000 jobs and about 35 billion to our GDP, and that's just representing 10% of our nation's fuel supply. Since 2008, biofuels have accounted for nearly a billion tons of greenhouse gas emissions, and that's, again, with only 10% of ethanol in the fuel tank today. We just completed a recent study that said if we went to a nationwide E15, which is now a 15% ethanol blend, which is now approved for more than 95% of the vehicles on the road today, all 2001 and newer models, we can get 17 million tons annually of greenhouse gas reductions, the equivalent of taking 4 million additional cars off the road, also create an additional 183,000 jobs, generate 10 billion in household income, 1.7 billion in federal taxes and 1.6 billion in state and local tax income as well. So a win-win for jobs, the climate, as well as, as state, local, and federal government, and, and American household savings and fuel in fuel savings as well. Um, beyond E15, I think we're also looking for a future that we can increase vehicle efficiency um, as you know, the automakers move to electrification or if they, you know, improve engine efficiency today, we can use higher octane fuels. Ethanol is one of the highest, cleanest octane sources in the world. And so using a higher ethanol blend in, in conjunction with smaller, higher compression engines, we can get the benefits of a cleaner fuel as well as improved engine efficiency as well. And so really talking about maximizing those benefits in the 25 to 35 percent, 20 to 30, 25 to 30 percent ethanol range. Um, and so really looking forward, I think for the things that we need to continue to sustain that kind of those benefits, those jobs, these are jobs in rural areas. A lot of times the ethanol plant and the farmers that they support are the main employers in a particular area. Um, and so these are critical moving forward and to continue to, to sustain those jobs and sustain that kind of growth. I, you know, I think as many of the panelists have noted, we need 
clarity and reliability of policy. Uh, we have a strong renewable fuel standard, but at times it hasn't been implemented the way it, it should, and often at times it's been delayed. And so that's frozen important investment in, in not only the conventional biofuel space, but in additional innovations at the plant. Um, additionally, we have a number of pathways under the renewable fuel standard. These are for cellulosic biofuel. So these are biofuels that generate 60% or more reductions in greenhouse gas emission. They've been sitting at, you know, at EPA waiting for approval for, you know, nearly four years. Uh, so it's critical that some of these things move through the regulatory process. I think additionally, I, I know a number of people have talked about infrastructure. Uh, we've had several investments in biofuels infrastructure and blender pumps and getting some of these higher blends out into our transportation fuel system. It's critical we continue those types of investment. Uh, that way retailers can offer us a, a wide range of solutions to their customers uh, to address some of these things. So those are some of the policy things that we're looking for. Um, those are the types of things that I think will continue us forward on you know, a path towards not only more clean energy solution, solutions and clean energy in our transportation space, but also continue to grow jobs, and particularly grow jobs in rural areas where oftentimes there aren't that many opportunities. So with that, I, I will be brief and uh, we'll throw it back and hopefully uh, open up to a great conversation. Well, there is no doubt about that. Um, I said at the beginning, we had an all-star panel and um, you all lived up to that. So thank you so much for six excellent presentations. Um, and we have um, eh, 16, 17-ish minutes for discussion. Um, many of you actually already talked about one of the things I wanted to ask about, which is sort of policy barriers and um, sort of things that are preventing us from reaching sort of maximum clean energy workforce development. Um, many of you also talked about um, issues of equity and climate justice. And I'd like to kind of try to bring together um, sort of using the discussion thread um, about what the potential is for the clean energy workforce to really contribute to broader equity and justice goals. Um, these are goals that are priorities of, of many on the Hill, but they're also a big priority of the administration right now. Um, and I think um, it's not, I think it's fair to say that they're looking at um, the kinds of jobs that we've just talked about as a potential driver for, um, you know, like what Paula said, sort of building back better. Um, Abby, could we start with you and um, hear a little bit more about your thoughts about the, um, the potential to use workforce development to deliver more broadly for equity and climate justice? Yeah, thank you, Dan. I'm happy to chat about that. And I know some of my colleagues here have, um, quite well thought out strategies as well. Um, we think at CEO, we think about, about it in two ways. We think about it both in terms of, of our own workforce, and then we think about it in terms of our customer base. And so I don't wanna pretend that they're bo no, both not part of this equity discussion because they are, but in terms of the, um, the workforce, and Paula, I really appreciate what you said about careers and wealth building opportunities and entrepreneurial opportunities. I mean, you know, I think all of us said in one way or the other, you know, the clean energy revolution is happening and it is, and you know, we all threw out lots of big numbers, but even so there's so much more potential to grow. And so there are very few times I feel like in our nation's history when, when we know there's gonna be this massive transition and we can really be intentional about how we craft it. And so, you know, Jason talked a lot about um, the benefits and the pay and sort of what those uh, careers look like, right? They're not, and how your employees and how your workforce is valued and um, kept safe and all of those things. And so I do think there's a huge opportunity to really be intentional about um, how we go about training and how we go about recruiting. Um, I do think too that um, the the communities that we serve is a really important piece as well. So it's not simply, you know, who works for us, but who are we working for, right? <laughs> who, who is this clean energy transition? Who's benefiting from that clean air and, uh, and clean waterways and those other sorts of things. And so, um, you know, we, we do a lot of thinking about making sure that communities that have historically been either harmed by more traditional fuels or, you know, their voice hasn't been heard in terms of siting decisions, 
they have a much more active role in the in the uh, future of their of their their own energy futures. Thanks, um, Paula. Let's continue going down the line. Um, love to hear your expanded thoughts on this. Yeah, I think for us at the alliance, so just build off of what Abby said, we're certainly looking internally at our organization and what does equity mean within our organization and how do we create a workplace that um, would allow us to have inclusivity in a way that all kinds of people could work for us and we would really just move forward together. Um, and my members are thinking about that. But I think as an advocacy organization, we are also thinking about what is the language that we would like to see in legislation that would further that cause. Um, and Abby's touched on something. So a piece of it is workforce, and we all talk about workforce. But I would suggest that a larger piece of this is about small business and wealth creation. And that means you know, who are the vendors? Who are, who's doing the work for us? Where are they doing the work? Who's doing the work for us at the Alliance? But how can we create opportunities for other small business owners to participate in our community? Uh, what we learned from the pandemic is that Black-owned businesses were hit the hardest. Most of them um, are not coming back. And so in some of the policy priorities that we have at the Alliance, um, Main Street being one, which is directed at small business, um, we do think about, so how do you ensure that small businesses and underserved communities not only get the opportunity to get grant money and enact energy efficiency within their own facilities, but how also can we ensure that they get to do the work in those communities? Um, and so it's a twofer. Um, we say the same thing about um, Build Back Better, Open Back Better, which is our mission critical about um, large buildings, um, schools, hospitals, public buildings. We're also, though, asking our policymakers and thinking about what needs to happen to ensure, again, that those people, those businesses, get an opportunity to participate. Um, it's, it's certainly my opinion um, that if we are not specific and directed about that particular specific and directive about equity, it just will not happen. Um, we've tried the, like, let's hope it happens, and we see where we've landed. And so now we have to just say, if this is what we want to see happen, how are we going to build that in? And then the third thing I would say for us at the Alliance, and you heard me talk about what I believe is the power of energy efficiency, um, we're thinking about what would it require for mass adoption of, say, energy efficiency in every single residential home, multifamily, single family, et cetera. Well, then you start to think about the policies that are in place to get people to enact, and then you got to think about does that work, right? So um, our tax credits for energy efficiency are great tax credits, but they're not enough. Uh, and I'll just use myself as an example, having just replaced windows in, in my home. Um, if I replace with energy efficiency, the tax credit today is $200 for my lifetime. $200 for a lifetime. I replaced eight windows and it cost me 4,500 bucks. So $200 is actually not an incentive for me to do something else, right? You do it because you want to. Um, and so we at the Alliance are thinking about existing policies and how do we ensure that there's equitable access, um, not only for our products, but also for people to participate. Thanks, thanks for that. Um, Jason, let's go to you next. Um, love to hear your sort of expanded thoughts on this. Um, sort of building on what, what Abby and Paula just said. Hello. Yeah, and I'm going to have to jump uh, here in one minute, so I'm going to be very, very brief. Um, oh, I cannot hear you. Can you actually, I you. Can, can I just can come I right back? You? Can you go to your the next speaker, and then I'm going to come right back? Sure. Yes, because someone else uh, can't hear you. I cannot hear you. Hear you. <laughs> um, Heather, let's jump to you. Um, love to hear oh. your uh, expanded thoughts, and then we'll come back to Jason. Uh, yeah, oh. sure. Um, so I, I guess just a, a, a few things. Um, one, I think it's pretty exciting as somebody who's been watching the climate and clean energy movement for the last two decades, the fact that we are having the, we, we've put equity and justice in the center of this discussion, I think shows um, a lot about how the conversation, not only inside the Beltway, but across the country has really changed. And I think there are a lot of um, advocates that deserve a lot of credit for getting equity and, and climate justice issues front and center. And, you know, I, I think the Biden administration also gets a lot of kudos for being so thoughtful about um, how they have really, you know, 
raise these issues as as as, as front and center and are, are taking a leadership position. Um, as the American Clean Power Association, I mean, you know, we're we've been around all, all the way back since January of this year. Um, we have launched an internal effort with Boston Consulting Group where we're looking to work directly with our member member companies around core commitments on um, pay benefits career pathways and de and i so we're really excited about that effort and um you know hopefully we'll have some um big public commitments uh to announce in the not too distant future um the other thing that is particularly exciting to me uh, about the, the conversation that we as an industry are having is it's also about how do we how is, what does that transition for displaced workers look like? So, you know, our right now, you know, going, to, we're in the process of um, actually filming a, a few really exciting projects around the country to just sort of lift up the stories about what's really happening with new worker opportunities in the renewable sector. So former oil and gas workers, that are going to work to build, um, you know, the ships that are going to deploy offshore wind, um, uh, you know, the steel from the state of West Virginia that's going into um, into these products, the um, uh, the 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 you know the um, oil and gas workers that are actually using their skill sets. Um, to build, as, as Jason spoke about, some of the um, offshore, the early offshore wind um, uh, turbines. So there's a, there, I think we, we, in the same way that all of my colleagues think about it holistically, it's not just about what can our trade association do, but it's how do we, um, how do we work together with the industry to meet the challenge of this time. Thanks. Jason, is it safe to go back to you? <laughs> That's a fair question. Yeah, I apologize for that. Um, let me let me plagiarize Abby's use of the word intentional. Um, if, if we want workforce development policy to drive equity in this clean energy economy, we got we, we got to be intentional about it, and, and we've got to be intentional about the policy models that that we use. Um, w one of the interesting things uh, ab about the the process of developing a new generation of clean energy tax credits has, has been talking with a lot of my colleagues about the, the registered apprenticeship uh, program that is run by the Department of Labor and that encompasses uh, programs across the country. And I mention it because um, they are really the fulcrum of what has been a very successful and replicated construction careers pathway model, right? That, that typically is grounded with commitments to hire from the communities in which projects are 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 taking place with with a particular emphasis on on workers who are underrepresented in the current construction workforce so let's be clear that's black americans that's women uh latino workers are not underrepresented but they are underrepresented in the most skilled and best paid jobs right so um there, there, we have a, 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 a number of examples of, of targeted hiring coupled with pre-apprenticeship to registered apprenticeship pathways on the projects themselves that then get those workers who are from those communities into a registered apprenticeship program and ultimately a long-term career in the building trades, which is what this is gonna take. Um, registered apprenticeship programs are at the, the heart of that and they bring uh, and leverage about $1.6 billion a year in private sector investment from their union uh, and business partner uh, 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 joint uh, administrators. So I, I, I just wanna give a shout out to that piece of this because it's, it's now a part of the policy debate. I also think it's a part of the solution. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Genevieve, we'll turn to you. Thanks, Dan. Um, I think, um some really good pieces again I, I will also um, cherry pick from the, the previous speakers in that um, the what we're talking about when we're talking about an equitable energy transition that is not only the the technology and the markets and the workers but it is the folks who use those and who can achieve who can get the benefits of that and in the case of electrification 
it absolutely means building the market here, uh, building a U.S. market at manufacturing capacity and, and investing in that sort of in the bish, like the 48C bill that um, Senators Manchin and Stabenow have to, have to be building uh, electric transportation facilities in formerly coal country areas to act to get to those um, those transitioning workers. Um, and to uh, Jason's point, absolutely that we need to be building and expanding and growing pathways for this new workforce. As we've all talked about, these these are some some uh, a whole world of new jobs, and that the fact of deploying um, as 500,000 charging stations is going to take a, a whole bunch of new workers, and we need to be creating pathways. From from new sources to, to get to those folks and create um, create those those good job opportunities and those careers as was mentioned in, in the, the very beginning um, and finally this these investments have to how we build out this infrastructure and this marketplace needs to make sure that folks at all income levels can access the benefits of clean transportation whether that's a car a ride share or a bus. Yep. and that they have access to charging in all the different ways that people live in rural or urban communities. Thanks. Chris, this means you get the last word of the 2021 Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. Wow, uh, a lot of pressure. Um, no, I'll just, I, I, and I touched on this a little bit in our remarks. I mean, I, you know, for the biofuels industry, these are, we are creating jobs in areas that may only have one or two employers and don't have a lot of opportunities. And these are good, high skilled jobs. You know, Emmitsburg, Iowa, Hennepin, Illinois, Boyceville, you know, these are places where a biofuels facility may be the primary employer and may be, you know, what was only one market for that area's farmers is creating an additional market. And, competition in the marketplace. I think the other thing on the equity side too is, is really the environmental benefits that biofuels bring. Uh, you know, where fuel is used the most tends to be urban areas. That's where we're generating a lot of, a lot of uh, toxic emissions from today's you know, petroleum fuels. And so with biofuels, we're able to clean up and reduce greenhouse gas emissions, but other harmful pollutants such as carbon monoxide, in particulate emissions as well. At the same time, we're reducing costs for consumers all over the place, whether it be that urban areas or rural areas. So you get the benefits on the environmental side as well, the reduced costs and creation of jobs in a lot of areas that may not have as many opportunities. Thanks, Chris, that was really well said. And I really appreciate everyone um, and, and Jason as well for helping pull together some of those ideas in a, in a thread. It's, you know, listening to the entire set of presentations is. Great, um, and everyone should do it, but I think really it helps our audience really when we can pull everything together and sort of have a cohesive conversation about it. I really appreciate it. Um, Abby, Paula, uh, Heather, Genevieve and Chris, and to Jason too, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy Monday afternoon and joining us for the expo today. We re I really appreciate it and um, it's great to see you virtually um, and um, please stay tuned for, uh, for future in-person events that we are working on uh, with our friends with the, at the uh, House and Senate Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Conference. So thank you once again. Great panel. Um, and thank that you. just about concludes. Thank you, Jennifer. That uh, really just about concludes our day. Um, believe it or not, we are at the end of the 2021 uh, Expo uh, and Policy Forum. Um, I encourage everyone in our audience to visit us online at www.eesi.org forward slash expo. Uh, for more information about everything that you saw today, uh, we will have archived uh, webcasts of all of our panels, including those with um, Senator Reed, Senator Crapo, Representative Kind, um, and um, as well as Alejandro Moreno with DOE. Um, we also will have articles uh, about some of the solutions we've heard about today um, and, uh, and written summaries as well as the presentation. So it's a great resource. I encourage everyone to use it. And while you're there, it would be a huge wasted opportunity not to check out our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions. Um, there's a slide on your screen right now. If you have a few moments, we would love to have your feedback. We read every survey response that's submitted. We really appreciate it. It helps us do a better job 
um, providing the information, presenting the information, thinking about what information needs to be provided and presented. Um, uh, survey responses are, are very much appreciated if you have just a few moments. Um, this is where I launch into an extended series of thank yous. Um, we really, um, while I may be the, the person on the video today, by no means does that mean I did all of this myself. I'd like to start with thanking our leadership, uh, Senators Reed and Crapo, Senators Collin and Van Hollins, uh, Collins and Van Hollen, and uh, Representative Kind, uh, who is the newest member of um, our Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Caucus leadership. Thank you so much to them. Thank you also for their staff's uh, hard work over the past many months. They keep us on track. Um, they make sure um, that we're, the information that we're providing and the topics that we're covering um, are relevant to our main audience, which is congressional staff and other policymakers. Um, also like to thank uh, Becky Blood for all of the hard work pulling the panels together. Um, she is a delight to work with, and we really couldn't have had the expo today without her. Thanks also to Omri Laporte. If you've never met Omri, um, then that means you haven't met one of the hardest working people in show business. Um, Omri uh, really does it all, and without him, um, I would just be sitting here with a in front of a computer that probably wouldn't even be plugged in. Um, he works extremely hard on this event, and he also does all of our other communications work, or at least oversees it. He has a great team, including Dan O'Brien, Sidney O'Shaughnessy, and Emma Johnson working with him. So many, many thanks to him. Thanks also to our policy team, Anna McGinn, Amber Todoroff, and Savannah Bertrand, and our uh, summer interns who um, have contributed a lot to our coverage today. Um, and um, and that includes Anna Roberts, uh, Ashlyn, Irina, and Jackson for all of their hard work. We will go ahead and end it there. It is five o'clock exactly, which I feel pretty good about. Thank you to everyone in our audience for joining us today. And um, I wish everyone a great Monday afternoon. And uh, please stay tuned. We will be making some announcements about our post-Labor Day congressional education um, events. We also have some really cool fact sheets coming out, including an update to our very widely read fossil fuel subsidy fact sheet. Um, and you heard a lot about the jobs um, and some of the jobs reports that are coming out. We also have a fact sheet coming out about that shortly, and it will include adaptation, climate adaptation jobs for the first time. We're really excited about that. With there, we'll end it. Thank you so much uh, to all of our panelists and all of our Congressional Caucus leadership, all of the staff, and to everyone in our audience. Thanks so much for making the Expo a big success today. Thanks.